Third. Representative Benson John moves the minutes for April third. Third. Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, all those in favor please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no, and that motion is adopted. I would like to move the proposed calendar for the day, which um, I want to make a slight modification to. Um, the calendar in your packet says Tuesday, April fifteenth. Maybe it wouldn't be snowing anymore if it was Tuesday, April 15th, but it should say Tuesday, April 8th. So I'd like to move the proposed calendar for the day for Tuesday, April 8th, 2014. Any questions? Seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed say no. And that motion is stopped. Thank you, members. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, we're going to take up uh, more information on uh, the Capitol Office building. And we had a meeting back on February the 26th, I believe, a long hearing, three and a half hours or so, of a hearing talking about uh, the office building proposed by uh, the Senate and uh, its connection to the Capitol restoration, um, which, of course, has broad bipartisan support. And at the conclusion of that hearing, um, we had a number of questions um, that we still wanted answers um, to. And uh, so we did send communication over to uh, the Department of Administration and have had a number of conversations with them subsequently um, in order to get information back. And in your packet, you will have the letter that um, I sent over, including questions that were generated here. And then a letter in response uh, from the Department of from the Department of Administration, outlining their responses. And I'm assuming you all have that information in your packet and have had a chance to see it was posted. Also included um, is a chart that uh, summarizes that information. So our staff have gone through and summarize then the Capitol Office building as conceived by the Senate, a repurposing of the Ford building, um, what it would take, what it would cost to move the Senate to the transportation building, uh, repurposing the administration building, uh, short-term lease space and long-term lease space, all things that we had talked about in the hearing. And um, so on this chart, that you have in your packet, those options are laid out with um, cost attached estimates. Um, and that was posted for people to have a look at. And then also finally is um, a capital office building schematic, which we got late yesterday and was posted, I believe, um, the, early this morning. <laughs> for people to have a look at, and this does include the schematic with 67 offices in the building, which um, I know a number of members of the House, and I think, frankly, people in the public um, expect that an office building built for the Senate would have 67 offices in it. I also want to call your attention to um, the document that talks about the Minnesota State Capitol, and this is important. Um, it's important because so much of uh, what we're uh, talking about today in terms of options for the Senate are predicated on the restoration of the state capitol. And the state capitol um, is, of course, a gem, a jewel for the, the people of Minnesota. It is a space that is used frequently by the people of Minnesota. And if you look at this document, and, of course, if we think about our days here at the Capitol while we're in session, we know that the Capitol is a well-used and well-worn building. Um, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot get out of my mind Representative Erdahl standing on the floor of the House back in 2012, I think, with a big chunk of a facade of the Capitol that had come off. Um, we um, we are, inhabit this building, the Capitol space, all of the time. It is a functional space for us, and it is a functional place for the, 
for the people who come to the Capitol um, to participate in our democracy. And I think we know, because we're here all the time, that it is uh, crumbling in terms of its infrastructure and needs um, that restoration that we've all supported. And the restoration is going to displace a number of senators that are currently office there. Now, what we're getting for the restoration, as, as you can see in this sheet, is a more modern capital. So we will see, um, and, I, and I'm just going to walk through this because I think it's important. So I'm looking at the fact sheet, current versus plan. When I think about public space, there is going to be a new um, classroom dedicated to the public and the public's use. There are about um, 13,000 school tours that occur in the Capitol every year. About 60,000 kids come to the Capitol every year. I had a group come and visit me this week from St. Mark's. They came to talk with me about the issue of abortion. We had a great discussion in my office. It was civil and it was respectful and it was informational and we shared a lot of what we thought about the issue. Um, and they spent some of their time in the Capitol. Kids love to come here. They participate in a democracy. And they like to go to the Capitol. And they tour, and you see them there all the time. You get your pictures, take them with them on the steps, or they go into the Capitol, into the chambers of the House or the Senate. Um, but it is a place that they love. I know when my kids used to do Irish dance, their whole school came here one day for class pictures because they think the Capitol is an important place. So it is not just a place where we're doing business. It is a place that rep represents public discourse. It's a place that represents the seat of our democracy in Minnesota. And it is a place that people come to visit because they believe it's important. And we are creating a dedicated classroom space for an orientation and welcoming place next to the History Center that will be in the Capitol for the first time. I think that'll be useful. useful. There will be reserv reservable public dining rooms, and we're going to expand public dining capacity. And for those of you who have been in the Capitol, and I was over there yesterday um, when they had the bullying bill up in, um, on the floor of the Senate, and there was a long line of people waiting to get into a very cramped hearing room. And we've seen that over and over again here and in the Capitol when there are lots and lots of people interested in a particular issue. They are stuffed into that capital. They're everywhere. I've seen, you know, groups of people with box lunches um, sitting on the floor. Um, I've seen people, um, you know, jammed around tables in the dining room in the Rathskeller because there's not enough room. So we're expanding public dining capacity in the capital from 92 seats to 162 seats, and there will be reserv reservable public dining rooms, two of them, which will help, I think. Um, public access. There will be more accessible entries, five versus three, more public elevators, and for the first time, hurrah, hurrah, a women's bathroom on the first floor of the Capitol. And for those of us, you know, of that gender, that's a pretty good thing. There will also be a mother's room. There will be a dining area on the second floor of the Capitol. And for those of us who are doing business here on a regular basis, there will be a dedicated press room, press conference room in the Capitol, which will also be helpful. There are a number of things um, in terms of life safety, so the things that we come to anticipate in a modern building, uh, fresh, in, fresh air intakes, sprinklers, um, new exhaust and ventilation systems, new plumbing, uh, enclosed exit staircases, and um, stairs that take us outside of the building. There are new um, life safety measures being built into the Capitol that will make the building more functional and more modern and meet today's modern building codes, which I also think, you know, we should come to expect. So the capital restoration has been underway for a long time. It's nearing its completion. We know as a result of it that senators are being displaced. And the question for the legislature has been, what do we do about that? And uh, the Senate, uh, through a set of hearings last year, both in committee and on the floor, decided that they were going to finally propose a new building, which they did, and they put in the tax bill, and they voted for it, and that came over to us, and we voted for $3 million for design, and uh, over the course of the summer and fall, a number of us have participated in the design of a potential building. 
and I know Mr. Wislowski is going to talk about that when he comes up to the table, but it is the trajectory or the path of this issue that has brought us to here and now. Um, and as we have contemplated, and I think the House has done a very good job of thinking through all of the alternatives which are laid out on that chart of where we might house senators if they are no longer in the Capitol. Um, and we looked at both the functionality and we looked at the cost because they think we're always thinking about the bottom line and public access. Those are important goals for us. And based on the questions that we have put to the administration and the review of the information, I think it seems clear that the Capitol Office Building alternative, alternative is the least expensive option. And it's the best long-term solution that maximizes public access to the Capitol for the next 50 to 100 years. And I know, you know that this has become political. It wasn't very political over the summer when we were looking at the design. It was a, a bipartisan effort. I think there was bipartisan support for this idea when it was being debated in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, I remember Senator Senjum making comments. I heard the tape. Uh, he talked about this being a good idea. Um, Senator Senjum and Representative Dean participated in the design build work over the summer, um, selecting the architect. Um, so as we were contemplating the option of the designers <coughs> build out um, and of the office and its connection to the capital restoration, there has been bipartisan support. I will say it's become more politicized in the last couple of months. And I know now that um, we're going to have more of a political debate about that, and I acknowledge that. But if we want to set aside the politics, because that's part of our work here, but not necessarily the only thing we should consider, and instead we consider the goal of a functioning government um, that the public can participate in and a, a restored capital, then I think the Capitol Office Building, as we have conceived it and we have made changes to the plan that came from the Senate, I think it is the most cost-effective and most functional option going forward. And I hope that the data information that we've gotten from the administration, I'm going to call Wayne up, I hope that that is uh, information that uh, convinces you as well. And with that, Mr. Wisalski, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is, for the record, uh, Wayne Wisalski. I'm the Senior Director for Real Estate and Construction Services within the <coughs> Department of Administration. As we mentioned last time um, in our, our presentation and remarks, um, the, the issue around space and the capital is, is not new. Um, it really has been out there for over 30 years as the, the key hurdle that's been delaying capital restoration. And the records for, is clear on that. It goes back to uh, communications in, 19, in the 70s, follow-up communications in, in the 1980s, renewed efforts to focus on capital restoration um, again in 2000 and 2006. And each time uh, that restoration was contemplated, it looked at we, we're going to need additional space to be able to accomplish that. And that's really where capital restoration uh, has been held up. And, and what's been the consequence of that is uh, the buildings continue to deteriorate. We've, as things broke and stopped working, we've done piecemeal uh, uh, repairs. But a comprehensive, the building's now at a point it needs comprehensive restoration. And there's been strong bipartisan support around that. <coughs> and we've certainly appreciated that. Um, but the issue, the fundamental issue in, is, has been what do we do uh, with the functions that aren't going to fit back into the capital. The 2000 pre-design that was done um, had outlined uh, a recommendation for uh, a new uh, capital office building to, to accommodate those space needs. Uh, the 2006-2007 restoration plan had expansion of the capital. Uh, underground to the south to get all senators in the, in the Capitol building. Um, that plan failed to get support. Um, what's changed with Capitol restoration was the creation of the Capitol Preservation Commission, uh, bipartisan support to create that commission of a high level top leadership in state government that was responsible for the preservation of that building. And the goal in mind with that commission, and we, we looked to other states, how did they accomplish restoration of their capitals? There's many other states that have capitals that are of the same age have been able to accomplish restoration. And they started with uh, a bipartisan, most states started with a bipartisan group of top leaders that took responsibility as being stewards for the capital building 
and and then we're able to move capital restoration forward. So, 2011, we have creation of the of the Preservation Commission. Um, that leads to a master plan for in, in February of 2012 that gets approved by the Commission for restoration of the capital. In that master plan, it identifies there's going to be space impacts. Not not everything that's currently in the capital is going to be able to fit back in. Um, there's also the open question of functional improvements. If you're going to make improvements to the building, focusing on you know, the message was loud and clear. Make sure we do this right, and make sure we're thinking about the next hundred years and not just about uh, the immediate for future. That that we really want this building to be preserved for the next hundred years, and how do we accomplish that? Um, the, the master plan didn't say what solution should be for. Uh, the unmet space needs, and that's where, um, when the first appropriation was passed in 2012, it asked the uh, Commissioner of Administration to prepare, prepare a space recommendation report, and and we prepared that and submitted that in January of 2013, and outlined some options um, for meeting uh, the un, unmet space needs. From there, we then. Uh, after working with leadership, we uh, received a letter from uh, Speaker Thiessen, Majority Leader Bach, asking us to take study a, a new office building. We completed a preliminary pre-design, and that led to the authorizing legislation for the uh, new capital office uh, building. And since then, we've been proceeding with capital restoration based on the notion, uh, based on the direction that, that this capital office building uh, was going to happen. Uh, so our designs uh, for capital restoration are based on moving out a significant portion of uh, senators and staff and functions uh, over to the capital office building. And that's really brought us to this point, uh, Madam Chair and members. And um, obviously the question of alternatives and, uh, has been asked and, and we provided that information. Madam Chair, I'm happy to walk through these if that uh, would be uh, helpful. Uh, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Wislowski. I think it would be helpful if you would do that, please. Certainly. Um, the first question that was raised with the, what would be the overall cost of leasing temporary space, including rent, build up costs, operational costs, et cetera. And uh, if, if we're looking at uh, the temporary, temporary scenario, the key thing to keep in mind is that the capital office building was intended to be planned to be. Uh, to house the Senate chambers in 2016 along with four uh, additional hearing rooms. And so when we're thinking about temporary space, we would have to think about um, relocating what are options for, for standing up uh, chambers and, and additional hearing rooms. And how would public access work? How would uh, accessibility work uh, between, um, and just the logistics work between the House and, and the Senate and, and the public interaction in that process? This scenario that we, contemplated is that you would rather than stand up um, a, a separate chambers um, and hearing rooms in a different location first of all um, office space in down yes there's office space available in downtown st. Paul but they're not um, going to uh, be receptive to having legislative functions where you have public rallies um, and in uh, in their buildings with other tenants so you really would have to look at convention center type space uh, to, to lease for that type of use. This analysis that we provided uh, was based on the idea that you would, instead of doing that approach, you would reschedule capital restoration to work around keeping Senate chambers operational throughout capital restoration. Um, and it also would, based on the, the fact that if, if you don't have additional long-term space, you're going to have to redesign uh, the capital as well, and so it walks through those impacts. Um, and you know, basically, what we used in our analysis is we'd have to find about 50,000 square feet of, of temporary office space, um, and uh, we'd lease that for anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Uh, that would uh, to house senators and staff, um, the chamber functions, broadcast media functions hearing room functions, we'd have to rework the capital restoration schedule so that all uh, continue to occur in, in the capital. With that, I'm sure that really covers the temporary lease option unless there's questions around um, that option. Uh, well, Mr. Wislowski, can you just talk a little bit about um, uh, the, 
this, you know, when I think about the capital complex and uh, the connection to the, the building or to these alternatives, I think about the public accessing um, the Senate, their senators, and their ability to, to navigate. Um, and we had um, testimony at our hearing from um, the Council on Disabilities uh, at the last hearing. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about if, if we did the temporary, um, the short-term temporary lease. And we had senators, you know, in various buildings, um, what that would mean, especially for accessibility for the public or um, from those who are coming, um, the people with coming with disabilities. I think on here it talks about no public disability parking would be available. Can you just talk about that a little bit more, please? Sure. Madam Chair, members, and, and we've also been working closely uh, with the Council on Disabilities just related to the capital restoration plan uh, as well as, as this plan. And a key component, and it was in uh, directly in the legislation that required that we create uh, uh, par public parking, um, ADA accessible public parking as part of the capital office building plan uh, that would be located on lot B uh, and that would provide public ADA parking uh, for both the, the capital office building as, as well as to the capital building. And so in a short-term scenario, uh, depending on the location, you're, 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 we're going to be presenting a number of challenges uh, just on a, from a pure logistics standpoint. If, if you think of when uh, we have public events, uh, rallies where people have their day on the hill, uh, they're going from their House member to their, their Senate member, um, and they're doing that in a, a fairly compressed time. If we're locating some of that space in downtown St. Paul versus some of it on the Capitol Camp complex, it, it's obviously going to be a, a significant inconvenience uh, for the public as, as well as those with uh, disabilities. It's just going to present additional challenges for them. Would you like to proceed then to the other alternatives? Sure, Madam Chair. Um, then the question was again on uh, what current building... Madam, Madam Chair, I apologize. I uh, could I just ask one question? I don't mean to interrupt the testifier. Um, and I just uh, looking through the agenda and all the plans, and it's uh, interesting to hear how all this is because none of us were asked when it was first approved. Uh, are we going to be taking a vote at all, Madam Chair, today on this proposal, or is this another informational hearing where we're going to get great detail about what could have happened and what might have happened, but this is what we're going to do? Uh, Representative Zellers, we may take a vote today. May or may not? We may. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Please proceed. Madam Chair, members, uh, so the next question was, what current building and location leasing options are available to temporary house the, the Senate during Reconstruction? And they're really um, in the immediate proximity of, of the Capitol. Again, if we're looking at, it depends on the scenario, if we're looking at all of the Senate functions or just the uh, the office space requirements. Under this scenario, if you're looking at for approximately 50,000 square feet of office space, there's not that space available in the immediate uh, proximity to the capital. Certainly there's those there's options available in down, downtown St. Paul that meets those options. More than likely you're looking at multiple locations versus a, a single location to meet, uh, meet those space requirements. But this clearly depends on if you're moving all of the Senate or part of the Senate uh, on where you would have options for, for meeting those space requirements. Uh, as mentioned before, our process for doing that is we start with determining the space requirements um, and then go out into the market. Uh, clearly there's a number of office buildings in downtown St. Paul that have, I would say, in the 20,000 uh, and above uh, square foot space available, but once you get into a 50,000 or more, it, it gets pretty limited on your, your options available. Now, Chair, if not, no questions on that, I'll move on to the next uh, question. What would be the overall cost of leasing permanent space for the Senate um, and the likelihood that it's available on or near the capital complex? In this scenario, if we're, if we're looking at um, replicating the functions that were located, um, are designed to be located in uh, the new capital office building, so including hearing rooms um, as well as the broadcast media functions. 
and where the space would be used for uh, the chamber functions as well temporarily while capital restoration is occurring, you're really looking at a, a new construction scenario versus um, you know a, a downtown office building that is you know roughly 200,000 square feet. You're you're going to have mixed use tenants, other tenants there. Again, you're going to have um, location issues with how close in proximity to the capital building itself. You're also going to have uh, potential challenges. You, you would have challenges with public access to a downtown uh, location. So this scenario that we we priced out really was if you take uh, uh, had a developer that purchased land, uh, for example, at this at the Sears. Uh, site, uh, so you'd have uh, site acquisition ca costs, and then they uh, build uh, a new building to the specifications, um, and then enter into a long-term lease with the state. And that um, obviously has a significant cost uh, associated with with that of between uh, 165 million to 210 million um, is is a cost range on that. Madam Chair, I'll continue on to the next. Um, is the Department of Administration building capable of providing the additional space needed? Um, the Department of Administration building is is smaller than than the space requirements, so you would be looking at the admin building in combination with um, either the state office building or or another building. Um, with this scenario, uh, you assume that you would move all of the admin functions uh, out of the capital or out of the admin building in, in de into a into a leased facility. Um, either in proximity to the capital complex or in downtown St. Paul, uh, you're looking at a, a, a build-out cost range, and, and this is uh, just based on benchmarks versus uh, specific work. But if you basically repurpose the, the admin building, it's somewhere between $150 a, a square foot to $200 a square foot that you'd be looking at. Um, you'd also potentially have some, we just relocated capital security into the admin building, the, the uh, command and control center for the campus. So you'd have to make some decisions on if you're moving that function out again, there'd be some tenant improvement costs that would be uh, involved. Um, under this scenario, you're looking at um, anywhere from a one to two year delay related to capital restoration if the direction was to wait until this new space was completed uh, before you proceeded with uh, the remainder of capital restoration. And Mr. Wislowski, would there would there be hearing rooms um, in the repurposed administration building? Under under this scenario, Madam Chair, we would uh, the Senate would retain their existing space um, in in the Capitol as well as as the state office building, um, and you would look to add the three hearing rooms that are planned for the new Capitol office building. You would um, add those back into the into the Capitol. Uh, building itself, so you do some redesign work um, uh, with with the capital. <clears throat> Important to note, you'd also um, have to look at the broadcast media functions that are uh, planned to be relocated to the capital office building and, and locating them um, back into the capital. All right. Thank you. The next uh, question was related to the, the Ford building, um, and under that scenario, the this had. Um, obviously, has been an open issue on what to do with the Ford building. So there's been some past studies done around what would it take to renovate the Ford building, and there was uh, an option. For those that don't know, the Ford building is a, a vacant building that's just uh, directly to the north of us uh, on University Avenue. Uh, it's been vacant for um, over uh, around 14 years, I believe, 14 to 15 years. Doesn't have any mechanical systems in it. As uh, the roof and the facade. And so this is actually the, the renovation of the Ford building would be more expensive than new construction. Um, obviously, there, as part of the scenarios that have been looked at, it was also included that you would expand, have an expansion of, of the Ford building. Um, a 2000 estimate had put that at about a $42.5 million cost. If you inflate that, plus make some adjustments to what that scope would look like, um, you're in a 55 to 60 million dollar range uh, for that cost. This would assume that you uh, the, you do not relocate house, the hearing rooms uh, or the chambers over to that board building. That you would again put those back into the 
the Capitol building. So you do go through some additional redesign work on the Capitol. And if you're waiting until the, that Ford building uh, renovation expansion is completed, you'd be looking at about a two year delay on Capitol restoration. Next option looked at was the transportation building. Um, with the previous work that's been done, there's been trunk highway fund uh, dollars uh, invested in the transportation building. Um, so we did some research work with MMB and the AG's office on this. That they've indicated that we'd have to uh, pay back the trunk highway fund for the appraised value of the transportation building. Um, and then you add on top of that. So I obviously a, a, a very rough estimate of that appraised out value is, is 30 to 40 million dollars. Um, quite honestly, it could be more than more than that um, based on the amount of square footage. Um, but it all that analysis would depend on what the lease uh, rate assumptions are uh, with uh, with an appraisal. Uh, you'd have, in addition, you'd have build out costs uh, related to that. And again, you'd be uh, looking at a delay of capital restoration for one to two years. This scenario, um, there's enough space in the transportation building where you could house all of the functions that were planned for the capital office building in the transportation building. So there's enough space there. So that's also reflected in, in this analysis. And with that, Madam Chair, I think that um, goes through the questions that were in uh, the letter that you sent to us. Other questions? Representative Fettin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And just uh, from a point of uh, process, would be uh, Mr. Wozlowski, are there other testifiers that are going to come forward from uh, Department of Administration or uh, what would be and when would we be looking at a vote or what, what is your kind of uh, idea for the meeting? Uh, thank you, Representative Dean. I think that uh, we'll hear from um, the folks involved in the design and construction briefly and then take member questions and then proceed if we can to a vote. Okay, and the, uh, Madam Chair, uh, would, the, um, would the design questions be centered around the new proposal that uh, we see in our packets today or how, to, how we got here? So would the how we got here be better addressed to Mr. Wozlowski and the what's being proposed addressed to uh, the other folks? Maybe a little of both, depending on the question. We can have them both here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, is Commissioner Cronk here today? Uh, Representative Dean, he's not here um, right now. I don't know if he's around. And if okay. Okay. Thank you. I just, um, if I might, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair, I just had a couple questions. Representative Dean. Um, for Mr. Wozlowski. Um, it, as you were looking at the, um, at the, um, at the different alternatives based on the last meeting from the uh, that we had in February, um, how did you go about d determining uh, which of these alternatives would be designed? You've obviously asked the architects to look at uh, one option, which is a new building fitting everybody inside. Did you also ask the architects and designers to look at uh, some of the other options like um, using the existing space that we have. I know that we don't have any more senators than we used to have. We don't have any more attorney generals. We don't have any more members of the House of Representatives. Uh, but yet somehow we have this great need for a new office building. Um, and uh, many of the people that uh, have contacted me and uh, from my district and from around the state and from uh, from Main Street in Walker, Minnesota, where my parents have retired. Uh, they want to know why we need a, a new uh, office building. Uh, if we don't have any more senators, we don't have any more members of the House of Representatives, uh, why do we need to take up so much more space? Uh, I think they understand the concept behind rest restoring the capital, which, as you correctly point out, has achieved um, bipartisan support over the last 10 years. Um, did you ask the architects to look at, for example, uh, how they might fit as close to the current situation as possible uh, within the, the state office building, within the Capitol, and within adjoining buildings? 
Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Dean, um, on the capital restoration project, it really it took the direction from the Preservation Commission and that uh, approved the master plan. And the, the master plan for capital restoration was built on three principles. Um, and it was around architectural integrity. We wanted to honor Cass Gilbert's uh, original design uh, to the extent possible. Um, it was around uh, life safety. We wanted to correct the life safety issues that uh, were currently occurring with the Capitol. And it was around functionality. It was about making sure this built, the Capitol building uh, functioned uh, for the public and for the occupants over the next hundred years. So, Thank you, Mr. Wazlowski. And if I might, Madam Chair, so the architects were never asked to look at an alternative other than the new Senate office building and to put forward uh, what another alternative would be, either subsequent to the Rules Committee on February 26th or, or previous to that. Is that correct, Madam, Mr. Wazlowski? Madam Chair, Representative Dean, uh, what I was describing is how we got to this, this point on the current space plan, but the, it is correct that um, we have not asked the current design team for the capital restoration to uh, develop options for redesigning the capital. I would say that we've ran those we've done that analysis before. You know, we've had the question on what would it take to get all senators into the current footprint of the capital, and so we've uh, we've been through a number of um, you know, countless options for how to uh, use the the capital building should function going forward. So. Thank I would you, say Mr. there's been past analysis on that, but we haven't since the February meeting asked them to look at redesigning it. Thank you, Mr. Wazlowski. So it's fair to say that uh, uh, that from the time that this building was proposed uh, at the end of the session last year, there has not been, uh, that the administration has not asked the design team to pursue another option, either after the objections were raised uh, this summer by uh, by members of the legislature and the governor or subsequent to that, uh, the February meeting uh, when we looked at specific design options, one and only one option has been designed by the architects and proposed and put on paper. Is that, is that correct? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Dean, the, and that's why I was walking through the history of how we got to the current plan for the capital restoration, um, a lot of that uh, discussion and debate was happening, you know, from the time that the Preservation Commission was formed up until, you know, we again submitted a space recommendation report in January of, of 13. Um, out of that came um, a study of the new Capitol Office building and then authorization to proceed with that project. Um, so from that point on, from that authorization, we have not looked at other uh, alternatives for the Capitol building. And members, I'll, I'll call your attention again to uh, the restoration timeline in your packet. Um, I think it's like this. Um, it was available to us at our last hearing as well. Um, and it begins with uh, Governor Perpich memo on capital restoration dated 1984. Um, so this is certainly not a new topic. Um, and I, I know that uh, the Preservation Commission has been doing work. Cap Board's been doing work. Um, there's, there's been a a long and storied history, recently written about history, of the question of the capital restoration and what it means uh, both to the functioning of the capital, but also where the Senate should be housed. It's not a new question, and this outlines it for us if you'd like to take a look. And Madam Chair. If, Representative if, Dean. Thank you. If, if I might, I, I just want to um, just put on the record uh, uh, very clearly um, that there was no um, number one, from the cap board perspective, there was no directive given to the legislature for a new office building. Um, and number two, uh, that the folks who have designed and plan to construct this building are uh, just superior Minnesota designers and, and contractors that can and will do a fabulous job. And uh, I was asked to sit on the uh, selection committee for this to pick which contractors and which designers to do that along with you, Representative Murphy. Uh, but I also want to point out. actually helpful there, Representative Dean, given your history. Um, and I just want to point out that during that, um, there was objections to the process. And, and there is a memo that says no objections were expressed, no revisions requested by members. 
I just want to point out that uh, for the record that that is not the case uh, that and since that time I have um, not only filed an amicus brief to uh, Representative Knobloch's lawsuit but have in fact uh, introduced legislation uh, to uh, repeal that and uh, have made my objections to the process uh, not unknown uh, so I want to put that out for the record uh, before going any further um, and also and importantly I think that uh, to emphasize and underscore the point that this is not the de the administration's fault or the contractors fault or the designers fault they're all just doing their jobs uh, but the process that was put in place uh, by inserting this in the tax bill last year uh, without a committee hearing is unprecedented and putting it through uh, in such a manner uh, is unprecedented and it doesn't uh, go unnoticed um, and the uh, putting forward a larger building uh, with uh, is not answering the um, objections both just members of the legislature the governor has also been a very strong uh, uh, a critic of the building although he signed it in law um, but yet we're on uh, one and only one path moving forward and I think that's our objections uh, with the process so those are my comments about the process and I apologize for not being able to be more concise with that madam chair Representative Dean. You know, just for the record I want to you know because we, we quibbled about this before but there <laughs> representative Lincheski um, so thank you madam chair and, and representative Dean I don't know if you've heard me talk about this before I don't know where you even are um, I'm going to speak into my mic though instead of look at you so I hope you'll apologize uh, or I apologize that we're not making eye contact at this time but you know I want to say on the record again that and and with all due respect to Representative Dean that is not an accurate presentation of why this issue is before us so as the house tax chair and the head of the house conferees and the person who sat at the table I want to be clear for the record that what people continue to say is false. This provision did receive a public hearing. This provision was not a last minute provision. This provision was carried in the Senate bill from the very beginning. They had full public hearings on it. Uh, the public had every ability to come in and testify and they continued to pursue not only this provision but the entire capital complex in the Senate tax bill they put them together and in fact that's you know one of the core issues here is this this need for a building combined with the Senate office building or with the capital complex they are linked and the Senate carried them both in the tax bill there were public hearings on that and 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 representative Dean you know I respect you but I have to say I don't know if it's because um, there's media attention to this and I won't say that about you personally but there are certainly some who are trying to take an advantage by misrepresenting the process um, and and so I want to underline for the public who may not understand the process what a conference committee is and what a bicameral legislature is what bicameral means unlike Nebraska which is unicameral is that there are two bodies they hear bills they hear completely different bills they have completely different ideas and they bring them to the conference committee and it is that point where they are negotiated so in every tax bill, bill indeed including yours representative Dean and your yours representative sellers and and I don't know if representative Davids is in the room the two bodies take the other people's provisions and they lose on their provisions it is a back and forth so there are many items that were in that tax bill that the house brought forward for Republicans and Democrats and we got the Senate to agree to them and they didn't like them and they didn't carry them forward but we had full public hearings on those we had full public testimony on those the same is the truth for the for the Senate side they brought forward provisions that they had committee hearings on the public weighed in on and they bring them to the conference committee we know the House and Senate both agree to things that the, the other body doesn't like and they both give up things they don't other like uh, they don't like that's what negotiation is that is what compromise looks like uh, we could have shut down the government and we could have had a deal which is what happened the prior biennium with no public hearings no bill even not a bill not a public hearing there was a deal struck 
And that came out after a government shutdown. And I will tell you, if we want to tick through what was in those tax bills, ultimately there were tobacco bond appropriations with a, without being presented by the House or Senate ever, no hearing ever on either side, and yet they're law. So, you know, members, it's just a really a little frustrating for me to watch people talk about the process as if somebody did something at the end that nobody knew of, that happened in the dark, all not true. I want the record to reflect this was a bill carried by Senator Rest. She put it in the tax bill. She had a public hearing on it. Then the full Senate Tax Committee had a hearing on it. And that's how things come to conference. We all do that. We're, we're, every bill that gets conferred in this state by Republicans or Democrats, House or Senate, have different provisions. If they don't, you don't need a conference committee. That's what a concurrence is. So, you know, it's just sort of fundamental government 101 here, folks, that I just really... It's very frustrating. And just so the public is aware, because the public are the good guys here, and people are attempting to mislead them. So the public is on to hyperbole. And so let's be crystal clear. When two bodies have the same provisions that get hearings, you concur. There is no conference committee. When you don't have the same identical ideas, you have a conference committee. And both sides have to compromise, and the governor too. And that's how it's been under Governor Ventura, who I've worked with, Governor Plenty, Governor Dayton, Speaker Swigum, Speaker Kelleher, Speaker Zellers, Speaker Thiessen, Senate Majority Leader Roger Moe, Senate Majority Leader Dean Johnson, and, and Senate Majority Leader Amy Koch, and now Senate Majority Leader Bach. So, you know, let's be crystal clear on the process here. None of this happened in the dark of night at the last minute. Everyone who is a student of journalism should go back and check the facts. And I think we just need to call that out. And I know I've, I've kind of ranted for five minutes here, but it's very frustrating for me to watch people say things that aren't accurate and get away with it. And so I just want the record to show that none of that is accurate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Lincheski. Representative Zellers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, the, it, the I appreciate the... Uh, uh, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill explanation of the process, but as a member of the House Tax Committee, I don't remember having a hearing on the construction of a $90 million building or now a $76.8 million building for the Senate. And I'm not on the bonding committee, so if I miss that hearing in the House, I'll be happy to be corrected, but I don't believe that the House Bonding Committee had a hearing for a $93.5 million Senate office building. The point isn't whether or not something goes to conference committee or, Madam Chair, with all due respect, how many options you present now. You shoved a building into the tax bill. We bond for buildings. We bond for roads. We bond for bridges. You don't shove a a $93 million building. And now, to make it worse, if I read this right, you're going to take the public's garage out. So you're going to build a building for the Senate, but take the public's garage out. And we talk about access. And Chair Lincheski, I appreciate how a bill becomes a law. And yes, I was here when Chair Abrams ran the tax committee, and all kinds of things happen in the tax committee, especially the tax conference committee, that probably don't happen in the ag committee. But I don't remember throwing a $93.5 million parking garage and office complex into a tax bill that never had a hearing in the House. The Senate can do all kinds of idiotic things on their own, and they, they do, bipartisanly. But I don't remember the House having a hearing, in the, at least in the House Tax Committee, on this building. And to say that now all of a sudden we're the, the bad guys for bringing up the fact that this got stuck into the tax bill instead of the bonding bill. Why didn't you put in a bonding bill? And Madam Chair, we still have yet to see a funding line in here for your, in your budget. How are you going to pay for the, the lease to own on this? There's no funding in here. But to say that we're somehow by calling out the fact that we're going to pick up a net of 13 office spaces for a construction project that on a good year we're here for five, maybe six months. This year in an off year we're here maybe three or four months. So out of 24 months, we're talking roughly eight to nine months on the long end. And we just can't seem to get by. Woe is us. 
I mean, I'd like to ask some of the members of the media to come up here. You've been displaced. Did you get a $20 million building? Or did they find space for you over at the Centennial Building and you'll move back over? There's no way to do this project. These folks are over here during session, then we move them back after session. No, we just need to build a new building. That's the only option on the table. And I don't sit on the cap board, Representative Dean, I trust uh, absolutely when it comes to this. But I was never asked, Representative Blincheski or Madam Chair, what do you think of this building? What do you think should be the options going forward? I doubt most members of the legislature were given the chance to say, hey, you know what, how about we just do a little bit of shifting here, we'll move everybody to the west wing while we do this side, then we'll move them back to the east wing when we do this side, move some to the Centennial Building, some to the MnDOT Building. None of us were asked that. So for us to object now and say this process wasn't exactly crystal clear and we don't think it's fair, I think it's incumbent upon us and we shouldn't, have our, shouldn't wag your finger at us like we're doing something completely out of the blue and that on behalf of the public who, if I read this right, just lost their garage, but you get to keep your building, would be outraged. It's not us just coming in here picking a fight. This is people look at this and go, what are they doing? So, Madam Chair, I, I, I hope we do vote today, Madam Chair, because I think you should just get this over with. You know, and I, it's incumbent upon you as well. You passed a supplemental budget yesterday. I didn't see if it was in there. God knows with all those pages it could have been, but I don't see a line item to pay for this building. I don't know how you're going to pay the lease to own agreement after you build it, if you build it. Uh, but uh, I say we get to a vote, Madam Chair. Representative Lincheski. Well, Madam Chair, I, you know, and I know you're very fair, so I'm sure you'll allow a response to this as well. But, you know, I do want to say if, if it feels like I'm wagging my finger, I apologize. But I feel like there's a mockery of the process going on right now. And to say it's, you know, uh, you know, the schoolhouse rock, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, Sorry, it's fundamental here. That's what's going on here. People are misrepresenting the process. And if that means that there are actually legislators who don't understand the process, I mean, shame on us. But uh, the fact that the, the House didn't hear a bill is, is what's being said here. That happens every day and in the Senate, members. In fact, on the House floor today, I'm going to do an amendment for Representative Hoppe, who has a bill that's never had a hearing. Because we want to get it in the tax bill, and the Senate's never heard it either. And so what we're going to do then is we're going to try to hear it in the House, but we're going to have to go convince the Senate that Representative Hoppe's bill is a good idea. So I just, I just want to you know, yes. clarify for members what conference committees do is they look at other, the other body's bills that, of course, they did not have hearings on often. There are many bills introduced only in one body. There are many bills that are rejected by one body that the other likes. And that's what a conference committee does. That's why you elect people. They come here and they negotiate differences. And so, you know, I, I just really think that this is a critical piece. Be upset about the building or not, but please don't say the process wasn't followed. I, I just, you know, I, I, I hate to do the, you know, tick, you know, this for that. But, you know, I just have to say an example for those who want to track this down is a provision in two years ago tax bill, was indeed a bonding appropriation for over $700 million. It was never heard in the House or the Senate. And yet Representative Zellers and Senator Koch and Governor Dayton cut that deal. So for members to be acting like a $3 million provision that was heard in the Senate, that was a bill that did have a public hearing, and it wasn't $93 million, it was $3 million in planning money, um, to act like somehow some you know horrible thing has happened here, I think... You know, making the arguments about how you feel about the building is, is legitimate, and people are divided here. Yeah, I get that. But the public does have a right to know that this process actually had the typical process we see every day around here on the Environment Committee, the Transportation Committee, the Tax Committee, that you name it. And, and legislators are all elected, and they all get to carry bills. And if one, someone in the Senate has a bill and they get a hearing on it and they like it, they get to come and try to convince the House. And that doesn't mean the House has to hear it, or vice versa. So I, I just, you know, I really do respect the minority, and I always have. And I think as a minority member, and I've mostly been in the minority, Madam Chair, in the time I've been here, I have had a good relationship with the minority, and I think most people have been fair. Um, but I, I, I just can't let it go when there was a process followed and there has been a lot of headway made by people who are determined to mislead on this, to this topic to get the public to think that somehow there was a last-minute thing that never happens. Um, it wasn't last-minute. And it is exactly the process we do every day here. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Representative Lincheski. Representative Sellers. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Lincheski, again, I respect 
the Tax Committee Conference Committee. And tobacco bonds, you may not have liked them, it did, wasn't our idea, it came out of previous legislators, but it's not a building. This is a building. That's where, and I get that everybody cuts deals around here, somebody wants this and the Senate wants that, that's fine. The public doesn't like it, it's ugly, but that, at the end of the day, they don't understand the process. What they understand, though, is you don't put a building into the tax committee. That's what bonding is for. And I'm not going to question motives as to why you wouldn't put something like this into the bonding bill and then hope to get Republican support or even some Democrat support. But if, it's, if we're building a building, I don't know if the transportation building was carried in the tax committee bill. I don't know if the centennial building was carried over in the education bill. But in my time here, when we build buildings, we use the bonding committee. And bonding bills, the House and the Senate always have those spreadsheets. It's quite the little game to watch the table over there when the bonding committee sheets hit the table. What's in the House? What's in the Senate? What's it in at? How much over here? But a lot of times those bonding provisions are in there for several years. And again, if I missed it, if Representative Dean kept this one a secret in a drawer in his office and I didn't hear about the $93.5 million, .5 million office complex five years ago, I will stand to be corrected. But my point is that it wasn't in the bonding bill. It wasn't in the bonding committee. It was in the tax bill. And the process, how, justify the process however you want. I'm just trying to point out that this isn't following the normal process. And we can go back to the rest of the debate, if you will, Madam Chair. I apologize for getting us derailed. But uh, I, on behalf of a lot of people that I talk to in the public, this isn't some political hot button issue. It is something that people look at and say, you gotta be kidding me, they're building a building for themselves. And I think they're really gonna be ticked when they find out the public lost their garage. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll okay, be quiet. And, and I, I just wanna say, members, again, there was no building in the tax bill. There was three million in planning money. That's why we're considering it now. But there are plenty of buildings in the tax bill all the time, and I'll just talk about a few more in last year's tax bill. There were all the proposals that are going to come down to Ro in Rochester, Destination Medical Center. There was the Mall of America expansion. Um, this year we're going to have some things for uh, Cook County. We just passed in the last tax bill that came over fun, um, a mega school project for the Iron Range. So, members, there are absolutely buildings in the tax bill. Um, and, in fact, I have a hard time thinking of a year when there haven't been. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Lincheski and Representative Sellers. Uh, Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just a question for the testifier. Um, well, first of all, you know I'm okay with the idea that uh, the members of the House that voted for this tax bill last year did it with wise, eyes wide open and voted for a new Senate office building. I'm okay with that. I think uh, Representative Lincheski has a good point there that uh, you know. People read the bill, they knew what they were voting on, and it appears now, based on testimony and the conversations, that uh, this is set in stone as a result of the tax bill and the $3 million that uh, was set aside for the planning. So I'm okay with, with that concept, that the process was wide open enough that all members who voted for that bill knew what they were voting for. Um, but well, for the testifier... Ordered, I do think it's important that we, the, in the tax bill, $3 million for design. Right. What you said. Which is right exactly what I'm heading towards, Madam Chair. Thank you. I was laying the foundation for that. Um, because the testimony is that now that the plan is there, because all of the footprints and everything for the Capitol were made based on the fact that $3 million was set aside for a new Senate office building. And that's how you decided to arrange the square footage within the Capitol. So that kind of set us in stone now where there are no other options uh, because um, that's the way the footprint was designed. Um, how much more square footage does this new plan have versus the old plan for the Senate office building? Madam Chair, Representative, it's about 11,000 gross square feet um, to get to uh, the 67. You're going from about a building that had an occupancy load of about 255 approximately to uh, increasing that to about a 320 um, or so occupant load. Okay. Um, Representative Woodard. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then why, why is the need to move the minority senators out of the, this, the, uh, the current office building? And what's the plan for all that office space that they'll be vacating to enter into their new, uh, in their new palace there across the street? Mr. Wisbosky. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, I think a key goal in, in thinking about 
a lot of conversations that were happening happening about what's the right thing to do and what's the how the best to provide public access um, and how to have uh, both minority and majority members interact more um, the idea of having all senators in one location um, we've heard that from uh, many many different from public uh, people in the public from members themselves um, from just a broad array as far as the space that's being would be vacated in in the state office building um, there would be certainly opportunities we have the revisor's office that has leased uh, space um, about a block away and, and bring them back from lease space so they're in two locations we can bring them back into the, the state office building so they're all in one uh, location there'd certainly be other uh, groups that are in lease facilities that could come back into the uh, into the state office building okay well madam chair uh, thank you well I think that's an, an awfully expensive in order for our senators to spend a little bit more time together uh, when it's we're in a complex but the argument I get I get what you're saying there um, I also noticed that there's a, a new dining room there's there's a public dining room apparently two new reserved reservable public dining rooms but I also notice we're going from zero to one uh, additional dining room is that a Senate dining room or what is that going to be Mr. Madam chair representative so at off the Rathskeller that's in in the basement that we're gonna have additional seating areas and then there's there's two there's a couple of historic rooms one was a in the 1930s it was a historic governor's dining room um, it's been used for press corps offices since that time there's also a su former Supreme Court dining area so we would restore both of those areas and have them as public reservable space and there'd also be additional seating capacity outside of that area the on the second floor of the Capitol um, you have the food service the services for the blind that has the food service out in the corridor um, we would create uh, a space and there used to be a space historically in the capital for this function uh, we would create a space so that's all that equipment is inside a room and there would be a, a way for the public to come in and access that mm -hmm. and there would be a minimal amount of seating on that second floor that and that serves the, the function the Rathskeller I think as everybody knows that dining stays open till about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon or so uh, the second floor becomes the the food service uh, for um, I, as the legislature goes into the evenings and, and to the late at night so that's that's the intent of getting that out of the public quarter that equipment out of the public corridor space and, and into a into a room into a more private space yep. okay uh, and my final question I'm mean, I'm sure in this line of questioning so I appreciate your indulgence but um, so the, the public parking that representative Zellers mentioned that will no longer uh, be a part of this plan how many parking spots are we losing as a result of plan a versus plan B uh, Mr. madam madam chair representative the the parking uh, facility that was planned on lot C uh, which is next to the the, the Ford building uh, that was going to be 474 stalls um, structure and that netted us, netted us out um, I believe it's about 270 or three it was about 300 net because we have existing surface parking so we're when we built the structure there we're we're, we're netting out and uh, what we've uh, had um, really the one of the drivers for for that is we currently lease 635 stalls uh, from Sears and Sears uh, about a year and a half ago put us on notice that they plan to redevelop uh, their site and we were going to uh, event and they went through the city approval process they went through the cap board approval process so we took them very seriously that they're intending to uh, redevelop their site um, that has not happened yet and we've been able to uh, extend our lease on that um, and so we're looking to continue to lease about 300 uh, stalls there so from a campus standpoint it really hinges on when would Sears um, make the decision to, uh, when would they be proceeding with their redevelopment to their site and that's when the campus would have the, the impact so overall we're netting out to um, where we currently are okay well, well madam chair this is just a clarification on the previous question then so uh, how many parking spots we're in plan a versus what is in plan B now that we're not doing that part I mean I get the net piece but how many are we losing between plan A and plan B 
So we're we're on lot C. We're losing a net gain of about 300. Okay. We're picking that up by extending our lease over on the, on the C or side. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I, I've got a few people on the list. Uh, Kansen, Sarah Anderson, Representative Loon, Representative Albright. We do have um, others to come testify, and Representative Carlson um, to talk about our the House's proposed alternative um, that we should make sure we get. Um, that onto the record uh, as we move through this. So uh, let's work through these questions and then we can proceed to that alternative if that's okay with the committee. All right, so uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. My questions were on the alternative so I can pass. Representative Anderson S. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Waslowski, can you tell me um, what the fiscal note is with us adding now? I assume that the Chair will be adding a new Senate office building to the Capitol complex. For the Department of Administration, what fiscal analysis have they done as far as maintenance and whatnot? Obviously, it's going to be an added cost for an ongoing uh, maintenance. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, Mr. Madam Chair, Representative, the, we haven't ran um, updated uh, debt service numbers based on the, the $76.8 million number, but the, the previous number on uh, um, on the full 89.5 was about uh, 6.4 million roughly in debt service payments and that would be over a 25 year period and operating costs on this type of facility range from um, obviously we're still doing the design and going through um, energy analysis but it's it, on camp on the campus it averages between 10 and 12 dollars um, per rentable square foot and Madam Chair, can you do the math for me? So if it's it's ten to twelve dollars per square foot, I can't remember what the total so square, the footage square foot would be. you're looking at. It's it's about um, around a hundred thousand square feet would be that where you calculate that off. Of. Okay, all right. Uh, and Madam Chair, um, I, my concern here is uh, in the time that I've spent at the legislature, I have never seen. A project like this going through the Rules Committee. In fact, I've never seen where the Rules Committee is the sole place where uh, a bill, uh, if you will, and this isn't even a bill, is discussed. We receive testimony only here. I've never, I, I don't recall ever seeing that before. And here we have a situation where you say that it was only three million in the, the tax bill. But you are basically going to be approving a $90 million project here without it having gone through any other committees. So if you say that it's just the $3 million here, well, that was just for the design cost. But you have yet to produce a bill that would do the rest of it. You're just assuming you're going to go plow ahead with the rest of this. And you haven't gone through state government finance. You haven't gone through the bonding committee. You haven't done any of those things. The Rules Committee is not the place to be having these kinds of discussions. We should have this go through the Ways and Means Committee, too. There's fiscal costs here, operating costs of 10 to $12 per square foot. That's costs that are going to have to come out of those budgets. That should have been part of the target that we had from yesterday. That should have been part of the omnibus omnibus bill. And yet you haven't done that. You haven't even introduced a bill. And here we're in a committee doing this where we don't accept public testimony on this piece. So if you're going to stick to the claim that, well, it was only the design money in the tax bill, then you should produce a bill that would travel through the normal traditional routes and not have it tucked away in a rules committee where the public doesn't get an opportunity to testify and where we don't look at the operating costs that will be an expense to the state for the long term. So now we're going to tuck this in for the state and you haven't accounted for it in anything. Not in this biennium's budget, not in the tails, nowhere. It's not part of the budget resolution. I, I don't remember. The, I, I don't remember seeing it as any part of the budget resolution. So, you know, I think that this is, you need to back up. You have put the cart completely in front of the horse here, and you need to produce a bill that is going to fund, if you claim that this was only the three million from last year, then you should put forward a bill that funds the rest of it. That doesn't belong here in the Rules Committee. If you're going to truly be transparent and not do shifts and gimmicks, then you should have a bill that would do that. 
And that's what I think a lot of the members are asking for, is to make sure that we're following what the procedure would be. I, I correct me, uh, Representative Lincheski, I don't remember if the tax conference committee from last year actually reviewed this project. I understand that it was maybe something that the Senate did, but traditionally in the conference committees, when there is a separate provision that is different from what the House position is, you accept testimony and those people come forward. At least that's what I remember when we did the smoking hot tax bill. I remember Davis and, and uh, Senator Ortman having people come forward on the provisions that were different so folks got a chance to hear it from both sides. So I think that we have completely run away with this and we haven't done the proper uh, 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 vetting of this project. I, there's a lot of unanswered questions here and that's what really I think is uh, troublesome to me. Mr. Wyslowski. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, just would, um, as far as the appropriation that will pay back the debt service and the operating costs, this is um, similar. It, it's basically the same mechanism that was used to, to fund the Anderson and the Freeman building um, in 2002 on the Capitol campus. And those payments and those costs occur after the building is completed. So you know, typically that process and how it worked in, in with Anderson and Freeman, as we were getting into the biennium where you'd start paying back those costs, that's when we would make the request uh, for those funds. And Madam Chair. Representative Anderson. Uh, and I assume those buildings had a bill attached to them that traveled through the legislative process. Mr. Madam Chair, Fosky. Representative, it was similar language to what was authorized um, here. And just for the record, um, and I, I, I always get troubled by uh, Implicate by the people implying that somehow we are not following the law or the rules of the legislature. And Representative Lincheski has talked about this, and I think it's made an articulate and clear case about how we got here and how it comports with the rules. And I will just say that we are here comporting with the law. Uh, we are following the law. The law um, is the reason why this this question is before the rules committee. Um, and I, you know, not a law breaker. I'm a law follower. And I think you are too, Representative Anderson. I think we all are. So, uh, you know, I, I, I get that people disagree about this building. And we might not like the way it happened. I didn't like the way we passed the budget after the government shut down. I could talk about that till I'm blue in the face. It's history. Um, but to say that somehow it's uh, not legal um, would be false because we are following the law. <laughs> Representative Loon. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just, um, Mr. Wazowski, um, I, I'm still trying to understand from the alternatives proposed on, on the sheet here what the interaction is with the current capital reconstruction and renovation going on. Because as I, I look at the new alternative plan, there's been some adjustments to parking in that and additional square footage, I believe, to accommodate an office for each of the 67 senators. But does that mean then that there won't be Senate offices in the Capitol any longer and that space will all be repurposed or will some senators have two offices? Uh, what's, what's the plan with that? Mr. Wyslowski. Madam Chair, Representative, the, how we've identified that and when we walk through the plan for the, um, the alternate uh, design for the Capitol Office building, we identified that, that space as you'll see what it would look like with all 67 and staff in. You'll also see it'll be identified as we called it flex space. So if, you know, obviously the, there's negotiations that happen ar around that. If um, the Senate uh, retains its, we continue with the current design for the Capitol, which has 23 senators and associated staff in the Capitol building. This other space could temporarily be used, um, again, to house other, bring other state functions back into uh, the Capitol uh, campus. So the timing of when it would become all 767 in, um, and we're not a debt dealing with that issue. It's just having the building be able to accommodate that um, at whatever point that decision is made. And from my understanding, I think there will be, after 2017 and the capital restoration is complete, the Senate uh, will make its way over uh, into that new building. 
Uh, Madam Chair. Philosophy. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative. Um, so right now we're not redesigning the Capitol, so that still has to, have to be a, a decision point with um, with the Senate. Um, obviously, they haven't um, provided the input on you know, the the alternative plan. Ma Madam Chair, Representative Lund, if, if I may, because I'm still not quite clear about this. So. Um, if I'm, I'm tracking what you're saying, Mr. Wazowski, um, a change has been made to accommodate all 67 yeah. senators, senators um, but the idea is that after construction has been completed, both on the Capitol and, and this building, that at some point there would still be um, the opportunity for senators, certain senators will still have offices in the Capitol and they may still have an office as well in the new Senate office building, or they'll have uh, two offices, or, or the choice of which office? Madam Chair, it'd be one or the other. It'd be either in the Capitol. Um, right now, in the current design for Capitol, we have the 23 uh, senators um, in uh, the Capitol, and that's primarily, if you look you know, at the space plans, it's primarily on the third floor of the Capitol where, where that happens. The, the conversation on when would all 67 move over uh, to the Senate and what that, or to the Capitol Office building, that hasn't happened yet. So um, you would have that conversation and then decide, are you gonna have a, uh, you're gonna have the space. The idea is looking out, this building's gonna be here for 100 years, you provide the space needed. Um, and obviously we're not driving that decision on when that uh, change would happen. Um. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, it sounds like then that the plan is to provide this space and we'll kind of figure out what to do with it later because you're going to have a surplus of offices, as I, if I'm understanding this correctly. You're going to have a space for all 67 senators in a new office, but yet you're going to have 23 offices in the Capitol. So at some point, you've got, you're building out an excess of space for offices, correct? Well, Representative Loon, I would see this differently. And when we finally do get um, the other testifiers up to talk about the building, the new build, the alternative, thank you, Representative Sellers, the alternative uh, that we're proposing, which is 67 offices, um, this is a subsequent discussion to the discussion that's happened among the tenants that uh, was considered when the Senate proposed the building with 44 offices. So the Senate's proposal. Uh, that came to us, we have two proposals before us actually today, um, has 44 offices in the Capitol Office building. And based on information, conversation uh, that I've had with um, both Democrats and Republicans and conversation that I've had with members of the public, uh, we felt it important that the building be uh, set with 67 offices in it. Um, the tenants have not come back together again um, since then. So Rep Mr. Wyslowski is talking about the plan uh, to uh, among the, the, that was the result of a conversation among the tenants, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, um, that fit with the Senate's proposal. We're, I think, today going to approve a different alternative with 67 offices in it. The tenants will then have that discussion. Um, those 23 offices that they had talked about included members of the minority and the majority um, with leadership offices for the Senate majority, the Senate minority, the House majority, the House minority. Um, I think the Senate will reconfigure their space. We're anticipating that the Senate and the Senators will be in the new building. Uh, but they haven't had that discussion yet because this is a new alternative um, that they haven't, um, you know, until uh, uh, the last couple of weeks in the conversation that we've had with the administration. We didn't know it was possible, uh, if it was possible to do it in a cost-effective way. And we have worked very hard with the administration and with the design group to find that <coughs> going forward. And my anticipation is that once the capital restoration is done um, and, the, and the capital office building is complete, um, that there will be 67 offices and bodies in those 67 offices. Thank you. And Madam Chair, just a, a quick procedural question. And, um, we've got, <clears throat> thank you, um, you know, some information here on alternatives and um, some uh, architectural drawings and that to help us um, contemplate this. But as you talked about an alternative. Is is that going to be in bill form, something that we're going to be voting on in committee, or what's what's the form 
when a vote's taken, what are we going to be using as the basis for our decision? We're going to hear, in fact, maybe we should move to this. We're going to hear from uh, folks about the alternative proposal, and we're going to take a vote on that. We have a schematic. We have the alterations to the plan um, here with us today. Okay. Thank you. So maybe we should invite um, the next testifiers up. So, Madam Chair, is there coming up? Can I ask just one question about that then? I have a number of people on the list. So I, I just want to ask if the Senate's going to vote on that. Your change in their plan after we pa or after you pass it out of here. Yes, Representative Zellers, the Senate has to take it. Okay. All right. So I want to let people know I have. Yeah, I have these people on the list: Representative Albright, mm -hmm. Representative Carlson, Representative Kelly, Representative Doubt. Are there questions that you want to ask before we proceed to the testimony? If I could, Madam Chair, just very, very quickly, I just wanted to make a clarification. Um, I did request a memo at our last meeting in February uh, from Pat McCormick, and, and that did come to me. Uh, I thought that it also went to you. I'm not sure if it did. I didn't see it distributed to the entire committee. But my question at the last uh, committee meeting was, um, have we had uh, other examples where, where buildings were built through a lease purchase agreement um, and and how was that authorizing language handled uh, the memo uh, did come back and and uh, just to clarify for the committee that the in 2002 the Anderson and Freeman buildings those were the last two that uh, that really have been built uh, by the state in, in in this sort of an agreement a lease purchase agreement it's my understanding although it's not in the memo that the the uh, agency that we used to uh, actually build the buildings and do the bonding was the St. Paul Port Authority and that we then leased them from uh, from the Port Authority uh, on a lease to own uh, sort of uh, uh, arrangement. Um, the language in 2002 for those buildings was carried, the authorizing language was carried in the capital investment bill and it did uh, receive at least a three-fifths vote of each body. So just to clarify that uh, this is a new arrangement, it's not something that we've done before. Um, and the last buildings uh, that were built, uh, the authorizing language was carried in the capital investment bill um, as is required by our Constitution. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Dell. All right. Madam Chair. I, I don't mean to, Kelly. but specifically to Mr. Waslowski, I have a question just on, a, on, on the uh, request for the, Kelly. thank you. Uh, Mr. Waslowski, I'm just curious, uh, you give uh, rent figures uh, for temporary, uh, rent paid for temporary space two and a half million, or two to two and a half million during that, during that time frame. And yet when we move to, to long term, we see five to seven million. And I'm, and I'm very curious as to, you know, why the change there uh, going from a short term to a long term? Mr. Wyslowski. Madam Chair, Representative, that, that short term scenario was providing only um, office space, 50,000 square feet of, of office space. The long term scenario was essentially saying you're going to take the functionality, so you're going to add in the, the three hearing rooms, the broadcast media functions, um, you're going to build um, a similar so you take the functional requirements that are being met in the capital office building and, and put that over on a lease scenario. So one on the short term basis, the idea was that you, or the analysis was that you rework the capital building schedule and, and you don't try to find temporary space for chambers and hearing rooms. But on a long term scenario, um, if you're going to locate all uh, senators over in a, uh, a leased facility, then you would look for those. Uh, that space uh, to be in that building. Um, Madam Chair, I guess I'm just uh, a little bit confused there because when we go into a situation where we're looking, we, we, we've asked kind of for an apples to apples comparison and, and, and a lot of people around this table came up with some great scenarios and questions. So when you're going into a long-term arrangement where you have all the leverage and you can, and you can negotiate there, uh, it just appears that every uh, scenario we laid out was conveniently uh, looked at in such a way that the cost uh, far outweighed those alternatives. And Madam Chair, I've heard you say several times now about, you know, you, you hate when politics gets into, gets into this issue, but uh, six weeks ago we were talking about a Senate office building and it appears today the only thing that's changed is that we're looking at a Capitol office building. I mean, that that's just you talk about politicizing things. The only people who are housed in this building is the, is the Senate. 
That's what we're talking about. And the only thing that has changed out of all the work of all these people sitting here is that we've gone from a Senate office building to a Capitol office building without any of our alternatives seriously looked at in an apples to apples comparison. And that's what we asked for. And I just don't believe we're getting that today. Representative Kelly, I am. Uh, you are entitled to your opinion, um, but I, it appears to me that that would be. Um, I won't get into what. It sounds like an accusation, but I will leave it at that. Um, uh, everyone who is seated at this table, if the public is watching, um, they should know, right, that there is a strong political charge attached to, to this effort. That hasn't always been the case with every building. I don't think it was the case when the Freeman building was, you know, <coughs> built. I don't think it was the case when the Anderson building was built. It's certainly not the case um, when we think about the capital restoration. It does not have the same political charge. Um, I don't think if we were here with the Capital Preservation Commission talking about capital restoration, we would have the folks from the Jobs Coalition videotaping us as they are today. But they are. And that says to me political charge. Um, so I think I, I just really want us to focus on what we have before us. Um, and you're entitled to your opinion. But we've asked, um, we asked in the hearing for information about alternatives. We didn't get all the information that we wanted in that hearing, so we went back to the drawing table with a letter. Um, and the administration has worked very hard with us to fine-tune that information um, so that we can make a, a decision based on that information. And to suggest that the information is false or nuanced in a way to get us to a conclusion, um, I think is unfortunate. Madam Chair, that was not my intention at all. And if you took that as an accusation, I apologize. My uh, opinion was just that we gave a lot of alternatives, and it seems like the only thing we we can't say anymore is Senate office building. We're talking about a, comp, a capital office building now. This is the same thing we were talking about six weeks ago. And I think that, um, I, you know, I keep wanting to get to the testimony so we can talk about an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I know Representative Albright has a question for Mr. Wislowski, so we'll proceed to that, and then we're going to get through the rest of this work so we can get on with our day. How about that? Representative Albright. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Uh, and to uh, Mr. Wozlowski, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm looking at a diagram overhead, and I'm curious. The lot, the parking lot that is uh, immediately north on uh, University from the Capitol, uh, currently what is the capa parking capacity of that parking lot, that surface lot? Mr. Wozlowski. Madam Chair, um, uh, Representative, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'd have to go back and, and get that number. <laughs> because it, thank you, Madam Chair. And as I look at the the, the whiting out of what would become uh, the new uh, Senate Legislative Office building, um, whited out and it's called Lot B. Um, would it be fair to say, without your knowledge of how many parking stalls are in that right now, and I appreciate it if you get that to me, sure. would it be fair to say that you're the building that is being proposed would take up approximately two thirds of that parking surface parking ramp, or is it all? My understanding with the landscaping, it would be all, presumably, would it not? Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, that's correct. There's parking um, that is proposed that, and as we go through the drawings, there's a, a lower level parking, um, and then there's a second level of parking. Uh, that's below grade, but on, on the surface, it's all, all building. But to yeah. the point in terms of what is existing. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and good afternoon, by the way. Um, uh, so, but to the point of the surface parking lot that we have available to uh, the public parking right now, uh, I, I would really appreciate it if you would provide to me that number uh, because things will change on that. My next or a follow-on question is Lot C, which I understand is not going to be constructed at this time. What was the proposed number of stalls that that uh, parking ramp would uh, support for public parking? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, first we just a comment on Lot B. There's no public parking currently on, on Lot B. That is all for uh, Senate uh, staff parking on, on Lot B. On, on Lot C, uh, we were looking at um, approximately between 40 and 50 
uh, stalls uh, available for public parking. Mr. Wisloski? I understood Lafayette would have uh, parking space for uh, the disabled. Yeah. Madam Chair, yeah, in the current in the in the plan, I'm talking about it, the current surface parking is oh, all um, it's all Senate staff. The new building. Um, Thirty but they're going to have to park somewhere now. Should all right. Can we proceed to the testimony? Please. Uh, well, welcome to the committee, and thank you for being here for the last hearing. I know you didn't get to join us for long. <laughs> If you could introduce yourself for the record, please. Sure. For the record, Madam Chair, my name is Catherine Leonidas, and I am with BWBR Architects. And I'm going to go through the packet of information that you have in front of you that is that is uh, labeled Capital Office Building. And just to give you an overview of some of the uh, changes that have been made since the last time we were here as, as part of this proposal um, that we have worked, we have worked very hard to um, pull together. The, um, and I think on page 13 you'll see sort of a summary of some of the, the, the primary changes that have occurred during the schematic design process and, and, and some very specifically since we last met in, in February. But you can see that, that um, if you look on page 3, I'm going, to st I'm going to take you somewhat just looking at the plan the uh, site is bounded by Sherburne Capitol Boulevard University and, and Park on the, on the left. The, there is a landscaped area uh, directly along University Avenue and the building does in fact tuck primarily along Capitol Park and, and Sherburne with access to the loading dock from Sherburne. <coughs> to uh, clarify the, the, uh, the site, if you look on page 4, that parking area which is at the tunnel current tunnel level that leads out of the capital to the north under University Avenue that will be all parking for uh, Senate and staff but that and that is uh, that does take up primarily the entire um, extent of the parking of the uh, lot in lot B the second level which is partially underground on the northeast corner but is out of the ground on the southwest corner um, is uh, parking for primarily uh, accessible parking as well as some Senate and staff parking. The, there are some uh, support functions. We, as, as Representative Murphy indicated, we've not vetted this yet with the Senate as to the specifics of all of these locations, but uh, we're looking at Senate support functions such as research, uh, SIS, uh, media services, uh, the loading dock, some plant management facilities to support the loading dock on this level. If you go up to the uh, page six, the first floor of this building or, or is in fact the hearing room level with some additional Senate support um, behind that. At this level, there will be three hearing rooms, one that seats 250 and two that will seat 150 um, uh, on the right-hand side with a public gathering space um, to the <coughs> south overlooking the Capitol. The next four sets of plans uh, take a little bit of explanation, but they are they represent levels two and levels three. And on the on level two, we have what we're intending to be the build out day one. The colors in in blue are the senators' offices, which we have uh, organized as we had done before, facing south and and primarily west. And there's some flex space then on the north side along Sherburne that, that will, um, in, if you look on the next page, have the ability to be built out for additional Senate offices. We were able to do this in a variety of ways. Um, one is we've decreased the size of the, of the um, uh, Senator's offices as in our, from our last proposal. And we've reduced the amount of conferencing space uh, within the within the area as well. On so page eight, then it would show the full build out on the second level if we were to in fact put all 67 senators there. Similarly, on level three, we're showing the the configuration how it would be built initially, where some flex space would be provided for some interim uses, 
and on page 10 then we show how the, the rest of that floor would be built out again to support 67 senators within that space. We've been able to do this primarily because we have moved most of the mechanical to the roof, uh, which, will, which provides some additional square footage then within the building to accommodate um, that additional programmed area. Additionally, since we last met, we have taken some, um, uh, have reevaluated re some of the um, exterior materials on the building. We have reduced the amount of glass and we have simplified some of the articulation on both the north and on the, on the south side. And what you see on page 12 it, um, is just a, uh, a reference to the south elevation where in the upper left-hand corner we had shown a, the opacity or the amount of glass that was on the building was about, on the south side was about 25%. With the proposed um, uh, redesign, we are looking at reducing the amount of glass that will in fact be there on that, on that south and west side. There was considerably less glass on the north face, but what we did on there was let, have let, actually have left the glass, but we simplified the, the articulation of that elevation. There have been a number of other things that we had done uh, as well it, through the course of the design and, and that have really re realized some of the cost savings and, and simplified some of the architecture, landscape architecture, some of the skylights. We've, we've just simplified some of the interior materials um, and, and really tried to bring this in at a, at a more cost-effective solution. Representative Albright. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just I'm just curious who asked uh, for the re the the reform reformation on these uh, uh, blueprints. Was it is it was it an outcome from the meeting in February? Representative Albright. Madam Chair. Uh, I I made a request. Okay. On behalf of, uh, uh, and uh, as a result of a lot of conversation that I've had with people, um, um, for the madam at the uh, test furniture. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, Catherine. Catherine. Um, on page nine, it notes flex space, and you, you talked about that, um, and I think that goes back to um, Representative Loon's uh, question. Is that that seem that the that space will be multi-purpose, or why was there kind of a, a dual approach done for a couple of these floors? Mr. Wyslowski, Madam Chair, Representative, that was at our direction to the design team because, again, as as Chair Murphy noted, we have not met with the tenant groups yet. This is an alternative that was requested. Um, by house rules and so we're presenting the alternative but we still have to go back to um, the tenants uh, uh, to um, have that conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you like to proceed and welcome to the committee? Um, committee members, uh, Madam Chair, my name is Greg Huber. I'm with Mortensen, um, Senior Design Phase Manager. So the uh, next piece of uh, information that we'll walk through is just the uh, project scope and uh, statement of project concept. So as uh, Catherine described, um, the uh, square footage that was uh, added was for the mechanical enclosure to um, have the air handling units on the roof to accommodate um, more space inside the footprint. Uh, the second page is uh, overall project budget of uh, 89.5 million um, and then a schedule uh, summary so <clears throat> the, the revision of the schedule uh, the duration would stay the same the completion date is uh, altered to uh, middle of November of 2015 um, immediately before the 2016 session The next page is a, a statement of uh, risk factors. One of the large risk factors noted is uh, scheduled just the speed of uh, um, the uh, design and construction to uh, uh, meet that date before the 2016 session. 
and then uh, building area tabulation that explains uh, the space allocation within the uh, building. Um, then the last page of the statement of project concept is just a schematic site plan of how uh, the building and the site fits into uh, um, the site on Lot B. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Zellers. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, uh, I had a question about the square footage, but um, the one question that came out of uh, the new plan, Madam Chair, from Representative Albright's question, uh, who authorized the House Rules Committee to spend the money on redesign? And I mean, was the CAP Board consulted? Were the CAP Renovation folks? Because if they, I mean, with all due respect to them, they're not going to do any new work on new plans unless somebody's going to authorize them to do it and then pay them for it. And I'm curious because that's something we have not, unless I missed it, I don't think we've talked about that in here either. Mr. Wyslowski. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, uh, this is out of the $3 million appropriation that we received uh, last year. The contract uh, with uh, the design build, build team is with Department of Administration. So uh, we obviously, the, the notion of 67 senators in was a strong message that came out of the House Rules conversation. Um, so we directed the design team to say what, you know, it, provide a concept that, that shows uh, what that would look like. We should say this isn't redesign. This is a, a, a concept that is being put forward to the, uh, to the House Rules um, and would then subsequently be put forward to Senate Rules. Um, so it, it is a very preliminary study of what that would look like. And essentially, as, as noted, the main thing was putting mechanical systems on the roof and what did that mean uh, for space, how, how would, much space would that free up within the building? Madam, Madam Chair. So Representative Sellers. Uh, maybe Mr. Wozlowski, I'll ask you, who told you to do that? Uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Representative, Wozlowski. it's part of our authorization already with the existing three million, but we were based on direction from you know, the feedback we were getting from House Rules from the previous hearing and also you know, subsequent conversations on what would it take to get 67 senators in. Representative Carlson? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to add a question about the actual space. That, that came out of Representative Albright's question. I'm sorry. Representative Zeller? So Mr. Huber or, and Catherine, I apologize. I didn't get your last name. I don't want to call you Catherine. but Th That's all right. Leonidas. <laughs> Or maybe I will stick with Catherine. Then. <laughs> Smart. So as as we're going through on uh, in page, uh, I think it was three, three, four, and five, where we were going through the space again, and with putting the electrical up on the roof. So we've actually made the building, the, the building larger, but taken away the public's parking. Is that? And that's not a politically loaded question. I'm just trying to figure out the, the square footage math here. Madam Chair. Representative Zeller, do you want, do you yeah, want to answer? Mm -hmm. Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Zeller, it's, worth, it's the same amount of parking on, on the Lot B site. So there were 265 uh, stalls in the previous design, and it's 265 stalls in this, uh, this design, and that includes the public ADA parking. The separate structure that was to the west, um, that's the parking that is not uh, included in this uh, plan. Okay, and thank you, Madam Chair. Just one, so the square footage inside the building, the public office space, or, the, or excuse me, the member office space has been increased. the The number of parking places that are available for the public is the same in the in this building as it was in the previous design or the previous options. Madam Chair, Representative Zellers, that's correct. On the ground floor of the of the original concept, there was uh, mechanical. All the mechanical space was on the ground floor. That has now moved up to the roof level. Um, so that's where you see the mechanical enclosure. And so that's what created the, the space needed to get to 60 senator, seven senators in plus staff. And so, Madam Chair, and this is a promise, my last question. Just, I just want to know the number. So how many staff parking places and how many public parking places in the redesign, Representative Carlson's redesign that's here in front of us are still available to the public, and how many are staff and member parking spots? Madam Chair, Representative Zellers, that number hasn't changed. It was 20 um, ADA 
uh, park installs uh, in the original design and it continues to be public, 20 public uh, ADA stalls in this design. And then, help, so staff, and I apologize, the num total number was so two, 265. 265, so two, thank you, Mr. Rizalski. And I did um, receive just a follow up on Representative Albright's question. So there's a currently uh, surface lot stalls is uh, 155 surface stalls online. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Representative Zellers. I've got a couple of people on the list, but I just want to keep us focused. It is almost 1 o'clock. Um, uh, so, you know, we had the hearing in February, and we're back here again today, and we've been here a couple of hours. So, you know, the issue, I, I will say, is getting a good airing. Um, when we finished the hearing in February, uh, I, you maybe recall that I was a little frustrated. Uh, because we weren't getting all the information that I, I thought was important for us. So sent the letter, have had subsequent conversations. Um, but because, uh, and Representative Dean made uh, reference to this, you know, he and I uh, uh, and another, a number of members were involved uh, beginning this summer on this project. Um, and I'm a nurse and not an architect. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm learning a whole lot. You, architects use words that... Um, you use them in different ways. <laughs> so I'm learning a lot about a different language. I could whip out my nursing language and, you know, razzle-dazzle you. I won't do that today. Um, and so because I've been involved in it, I've had the opportunity to talk with the public a lot about this issue and engage with the public a lot on this issue because they're, you know, hearing about it and hearing about, you know, the $90 million building, which it never was a $90 million building. But anyhow, um, hearing about that and calling the office. And so I've been talking with them. Um, and then I listened carefully uh, when we got together, right? And uh, I think Minnesotans are practical. It's one of the best reasons I like serving as a state representative in Minnesota because, uh, one, I think if Minnesotans feel like they're getting a fair shot uh, at information and they think we're being reasonable in our uh, decision-making based on good information, they'll even if they don't always agree, they'll come along. They'll respect the fact that we make a decision. Um, and one of the things I think that was hard for Minnesotans to understand is why we would, why there would be a building built um, for less than 67 senators if there are 67 members of the Senate. And I know that that was an early subject of discussion even this summer, and it has continued to be a question that I get not only from members of the House and the Senate, or the House Democrats and Republicans, but from the public: Why wouldn't we build a building with 67 offices? Um, and so, you know, I know there are questions about authority and, and how we got here. But um, I thought it was important um, through the course of the conversations that I've been having, the information that we've been sharing, the hearings that we have had, um, that we produce an alternative um, to what we got from um, the Senate Rules Committee that fit better with what we were hearing from the public. And, you know, we're hearing a lot of objections. Um, and so uh, what we have uh, before us, and I want to thank um, you for the work that you've done um, to make this possible, um, is a proposal with, uh, it's, a, it's a capital office building. It houses 67 senators. Um, it is functional. It's got three new hearing rooms for the public. It is accessible for the public. Um, it is functional for a modern government. And those were watchwords for me. They were important. Um, I think for the public. One of the other things that came out of the workshop, and I'll never forget this because it was Representative Matt Dean who talked about this, and he's much smarter about these things than I when it comes to design and architecture, is in one of the earlier workshops, he set as a principle for us that the building, the Capitol Office building, should be subservient to the Capitol, that the Capitol is the center of the Capitol complex. And I am grateful that the governor has pushed for a more um, simplified facade, and it's something that I think has been important to members of the House as well. And so I, I'm glad to hear you talk about um, the, redes the, redes the simplification of the facade, because I think that has also been something that um, has been important to members of the House and I think to the public, that they want, if there's going to be a new building for the Senate, um, that they want it to be a part of the Capitol complex, subservient to the, to the Capitol. I think that's right, but um, that looks like it belongs here. Um, on the complex. I think that part's important. We were happy to learn about Sears um, and the availability of the parking um, there, the continued availability there, which means we can delay. 
um, parking lot C, which saves us some money. It saves us about $26 million, um, which I think is great news. And um, the application of user financing um, to lot B is also important and saves us money. So we're able to bring the cost of the overall project down to $76 million while um, achieving the goal right, of the 67 members, 67 centered offices in that building. But I want to go back to the original point that we were hoping as a result of the capital restoration that we would have a functioning government. And for me, it is hard to imagine that a functioning government would have senators sprinkled throughout a bunch of buildings. And I, I uh, you know, we are used to having the Senate in two places, in the Capitol and in the State Office Building. And, you know, we can talk about the State Office Building at another time. I do remember spring and a leak here last year, and there was a lot of water up on the fourth floor. Um, I think this building is going to need some attention, and we're pretty stuffed into this building, but that's not the subject of discussion today. Um, the Capitol needs restoration. We're well underway on that. It's got strong support. Um, I think we have to answer the question where the Senate is housed. Um, they're not all going to go back into the Capitol. And uh, the idea of having them in one place where the public can access the, cap the senators in a building and the public can access the representatives in a building, and we are meeting together as we do Schoolhouse Rock in the Capitol to deliberate and find our conclusion on public policy makes sense to me. And so the, the alternative to what the Senate proposed um, includes 67 offices, a delay in Lot C, <coughs> user financing for the parking, an elimination of reflecting pools, of fitness centers, um, and a streamlined facade, which makes the building comport better with the Capitol complex. And I want to thank you for the work that you did on that. Um, and I know this has been a long project. And I remember um, in the design, when we were going through the design selection, asking all of the potential um, designers if they were prepared to deal with the politics of this issue. And everybody said yes. And I knew in my head that yes was uh, not an experienced yes. And I know now you know <laughs> <laughs> what we meant when we said, are you ready to deal with the politics? <laughs> you have learned, as I have, yes. uh, about the politics of uh, this kind of work. Um, so I, I know we still have questions. Um, I have a little list here, but I, I did want to focus this again on where we are, um, that before us is an alternative that meets and answers a lot of the questions that we've gotten, not only from the public, but from members of the body. And uh, if we're going to proceed with the building, I think it's important that we proceed with the building that meets with Minnesota's modesty and expectations about something that functions for the future and actually will um, make us proud into the future. And I think um, the work that you've done um, helps us get there. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So on the list, I have Representative Portman, Representative Anderson, Representative Lilly, and Representative Dean, and Representative Carlson. Yeah, well, Madam Chair, I temporarily passed because you were off into the building, but I can either wait or comment now. You recognized you me earlier. Go ahead. So, okay. Please proceed. Well, I, I just want to make a couple of points because so much of the discussion has been about the offices for senators. And the point I want to make is that uh, this building and that building will be used year-round. You have the public hearing rooms and you have the needs of the staff as well. So it's not just the senators that are being provided with additional space. It's Senate staff and then the needs of the public for additional hearing rooms. But uh, I did want to engage in just a little uh, history, uh, Madam Chair, during my time here. Uh, the needs of the Capitol complex have been be debated actually before I was here, but uh, while I was here, uh, the judicial building. The courts were housed in a very uh, small building that was originally built for the Historical Society and uh, uh, ultimately used, or I mean built for the uh, judiciary and then occupied by the historic uh, society. Uh, grossly inadequate, we responded to that with the new judicial building and as a part of that we built the new uh, uh, historical society uh, building uh, just south of the mall. Um, this building uh, was originally uh, mainly the agriculture department. And the decision was made uh, before I got here uh, when the um, current minority um, senators were in control to uh, begin the move into the state office building. And they took over the first two floors. Um, and they've been here uh, ever since. After that, and I won't describe when I was first elected like I did at the last meeting, the very 
difficult situation that uh, House members were in when we were housed in the Capitol, but we moved into this building and uh, moved the Department of Agriculture and then we occupied the rest of the building, some of it for commissions, uh, some of it for the legislative library, and, and so on. But uh, my whole point is there's this long history of the uh, needs of the capital complex, the campus, if you will. And actually, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the final piece, arguably, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the public is well served, that the uh, needs of the uh, Senate in this case and the staff is uh, well served and um, I think it's uh, time perhaps that we put this final piece in place and I think the ideas that the uh, House have brought forward to um, change the, uh, the dynamics of this a bit are important. But this whole idea of a, of a uh, Senate office building or a legislative office building or whatever we choose to uh, call, call it goes back to the Capitol building itself. There were proposals, a number of them, to change the footprint of the Capitol building. And each and every one of those failed. And one of the reasons that they failed was that it is an historic building. And a lot of us, myself included, didn't want to change the footprint of the Cass Gilbert building, one of the finest capitals in the United States of America. And in each of those discussions, then it would always end up, well, maybe at some point we should build a legislative office building or a Senate office building, depending on how this was perceived. So my point is, for years and years and years, there has been kind of in the background, if you will, the needs for office space and an office building to house either the entire legislature, some of the proposals were a, a bigger building than what... Um, I, I'm hesitating to say proposals, ideas, because they never reached quite the level that it finally did uh, with the uh, three million in planning funds for that uh, building. Um, and then I was just going to just a, a little bit of um, humor. Um, but when uh, <laughs> when the uh, reference was made to the governor's dining room being historic, and the media could probably comment on that, uh, my first term, Wendell Anderson was governor and I was invited to breakfast in the governor's dining room. I shined my shoes, got on my best suit in anticipation of breakfast with the governor in the governor's dining room. And I was never so disappointed in my entire life. It's, uh, what would we describe it? I see a couple of the press back there, uh, but kind of a dungeon. I, that's what I would call it. Uh, but uh, the press has been housed there uh, ever since the governor apparently gave up that space. But I did get dressed up for it. Are you suggesting the press has been housed in a dungeon, Representative Carlson? It, the facility, yes. It's uh, <laughs> like a dungeon. I don't know if I would call it a dungeon in that sense. But um, they're smiling. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, they're all fitting. <laughs> Representative Portman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. In February, I raised a lot of questions about this proposed Senate office building. One sentiment I articulate, articulated very strongly and encouraged my Republican counterparts to understand that we're on the same page is we want all the senators in one building. Really, this is about building space for the public and doing it in a cost-effective way. And when somebody from the public comes to the state capitol to see their state representative or their state senator, it makes sense that when they go to a building that houses senators, that all of the senators are there. So if they don't know where their senator's office is and they want to find their senator and they want to weigh in on legislation, they can find their senator without running around an entire capitol complex. So it was really important to me, and I think to my Republican colleagues as well, to see 67 senators in one building. So I'd like to thank you for that. Uh, another idea I liked even better was leasing space in downtown St. Paul and putting <laughs> all the senators, you know, maybe at an arm's length from us in downtown St. Paul. I thought it might be good for them to walk, uh, you know, up Kellogg or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Minneapolis would have worked. But I want to thank the majority leader for her detailed and in-depth investigation of really the cost-benefit analysis of the different alternatives. A third idea that I was pretty fond of is repurposing the Ford building. I hate that that building sits there empty. We at some point have to turn that into something. Um, but in the short term, looking at what makes sense, and in the long term, 
And the costs, as you've laid out the options, the lowest cost option that's best for public access to their representatives and their senators is the revised building. And, you know, I've heard my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talking about this is space for senators, it's for senators, it's for senators. Look at our own building right here where we have all the state representatives. Is your office for you? I don't do almost any of my work in my office. I meet with the public in my office. This hearing room, is this for us? No, it's not for us. This is where the public comes and testifies and observes. This is not a building for us. This is a building for the public. And in the same way, there should be a building for people to observe the Senate process. Uh, for many years, it seems to me the, the Senate has had like an ownership interest in the Capitol. And that makes really not a lot of sense. It is not a very accessible building. You've been over there, you've seen moms and kids on the first floor uh, trying to weigh in on legislation and find somewhere they can sit and they can eat and, tr and watch people try to navigate to find their senators in that building. It doesn't serve the public. This building will. It's cost effective and we should, we should approve it. Now, is it easy for us to vote for $76 million for a public building? You know, it's really easy to vote for $76 million in tax cuts. That's easy. But this building has been here since 1932. It's served the public for decades. This Senate office building will, too. And so even though we're the people who have to make the call, and it will be a political game in the next election, because how can you really complain about all-day, everyday kindergarten or a tuition freeze or a balanced budget or the fact that we ended on time or the fact that we didn't shut down the government? This you can complain about. I get it, but it's the right thing to do for generations. So I hope everybody will vote yes. Representative Anderson S. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question for you, but I also have a question for Ms. Leonidas. Did I say that right? Okay. Uh, earlier you had mentioned that um, uh, obviously the Senate, you're planning to move them out of here. Well, then the repurposing of this building, will that travel through the Rules Committee or will there actually be a bill for that or how will that work? Oh, Representative Anderson, uh, I, I think that's to be determined. I think that, you know, there's, we'll figure that out together. Um, we have a stake in that just like the public does, but I couldn't tell you right now. I'm thinking about this building and the work that we're doing right now and then going to the floor after this um, to do another uh, middle class tax cut bill. Um, I'm focused on that. So. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, my concern is, is uh, again, this is poorly thought out, going through the wrong process. We have a situation here where we're now going to move these senators out of this building. We have no idea what we're going to do with the space. Um, and you're, we already have a vacant uh, cafeteria that's been vacant for a long time. Uh, so, you know, I, I just don't think it's a good plan planning. And, and I think that's why you're hearing so many complaints from the citizens of the state is they keep looking at us, they see this empty space, and they say, well, what are you doing over there, and why do you need to build a new building? As Representative Dean pointed out, we haven't changed the number of the senators. We haven't changed the number of uh, uh, that component at all. We haven't changed that at all. And so I think that's where the public gets frustrated, and they see this you know, $90 million or $89.9 million or however much you want, and they say, you know what, that's not really the priorities of this state. This is not what we sent you to the Capitol to do. And that's, but that's what I think the frustration is, is that they don't want to see shiny new office buildings for us because they don't want that. They don't want their tax dollars being spent on that. Whether the space is going to be used by the public or not, they don't want their tax dollars being used that way. So I think that's part of the frustration. But I, that aside, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Linitis on page 13 of the uh, Senate office building here, You've got on number eight, the elimination of the service tunnel at the parking level. What is that? Can you give me a little more detail on that, please? Certainly, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson. At, at one point during the design process, we had had a dedicated tunnel that would go on the, on the tunnel level for the, around the parking. It was a much like, um, it, it would have, it would have been, it would have been from the loading dock on the on the Sherburn side all the way around. What we've done instead was we're, we have 
taken out a, we've taken a path through the parking ramp so that deliveries that come from the loading dock to the Capitol will take a dedicated path through the parking garage. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative uh, Anderson. Ms. Linitis, if you, could sh I, if you could show me a visual, not right now, but after the committee's done, because I just want to see how that impacts traffic flow and all that. Um, so that aside, uh, members, you know, I hope that we do get to vote on this today. Uh, and and I will be voting no, just to, I, if you were wondering, just say I know. Uh, because I just don't think that this is the proper use of the funds and the resources of our state. I don't think it's needed by any stretch of the means. Uh, I think that, as Representative Loon highlighted, I think it's problematic where we're having flex space where we say, well, the senators get to choose whether they want to be in the Capitol or they want to be in this new Senate office building. It flies in the argument that Representative Hortman just made is that they should all be in the same place. Well, if they get to choose where they want to be, that defeats the whole purpose of doing this whole building in the first place. So, uh, you know, I just, I think this is just wrong priorities uh, for this state. So there you have it. Representative Lilly. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, I just want to backtrack for uh, uh, quite a bit farther back to Representative Zeller's. Uh, one of the things that I felt really lucky this session is that, that in tax committee, you folks accepted a TIF provision that uh, for my little community of North St. Paul. And I was very grateful that bipartisanly that folks put that in. We didn't have a hearing. I kind of let the, I kind of blew it. and. Uh, and uh, it's something my community really needs, and I'm just, I can't express how grateful I am that it had bipartisan support and we have a chance to fight another day on a uh, piece of land that really needs help. But, and I, I know you, I, I know you know that. Um, some of this stuff is really sad to me. I, you know, I, um, I just wonder, you know, we're so lucky to serve in this capital. I mean, this, this, in these offices and, you know, I've been here 10 years, and I, I love to walk around. Sometimes I uh, follow the history tours, and, uh, you know, just to hear what they're saying, I learn a little piece about the building each time, and um, it's an amazing treasure. And I guess my question, I, I wish we could ask, it, you know, everybody in the state, if they've seen, the, like, the old photos of when the Capitol was built 100 years ago, and you've got horse and buggy and... Um, I mean, think about Minnesota at that time and to build this capital. And I, I just really seriously wonder if we would build this thing now. I mean, just how, how political, you know, these sort of things end up being. And, you know, think about it. Here you are. We're in this prairie. Really not much, you know, there's uh, a wonderful place, wonderful, beautiful lakes and land. But none of the buildings, you know, Minneapolis isn't the powerhouse it is now. Or the, we didn't have the Mall of America that... You know, the, you know, just so many on and on. But the folks decided, hey, we're, we're going to be something. We're going to build this capital. Would we build that now? You know, I just, I don't know. Um, you know, I was actually swayed today. I was, I was thinking, you know, coming into this, I had written something, and I was swayed by uh, Representative Murphy's comments, which she mentioned about Representative Dean about, because I do a lot of traveling, and I think, well, I was just in New York, and I, I, you know, my wife and I, we just literally stood there and looked at the new tower going up, and we took the Staten Island Ferry, and we see all these buildings and how great they are, and I was thinking, man, we, you know, if we're going to build this, let's do it right. But, you know, so we have to, I, I really respect what you said about uh, balancing that and making sure that the capital is the focus. Um, you know, our visitors that we get every day are really the, the focus of this this whole thing for me and makes the vote, uh, you know, quite a bit uh, more palatable. The, you know, I remember we were doing redistricting and I, I was kind of upset because I lost part of my district that I um, grew up in. My wife's, or my, my wife's was from that part. I was, my mom's family had a business in this part. And I, I remember saying to the speaker, you know, I, I take this part of this representative really seriously. You know, this is my district. And, and I, to the speaker's credit, he said, you know, none of this is our district, you know. I mean, it really isn't. It's not our, you know, none of this is ours. You know, it's not our Senate office. It's not our representative office. It's not, you know, this is all for the people. I mean, do they have access to us? So I love that I can run in, you know, uh, 
into the other minority members or even our leadership in this building. I love that. Um, I think it really, I always kind of joke like I'm a, you know, that we're lower tier members or whatever, but we get a chance to run into the leadership or walk over to the, to the house and have a, you know, and we have a conversation for that few minutes. I love those interactions and um, I really value that we're all together and I think that's really healthy um, across party lines and I think that's what you're, I hope we see in the Senate. You know, it may take some time to get there, but um, that everybody's there. But I, that's kind of my vision for this for the state, and I think that's uh, would be we'd all be better served by that. But uh, you know, there's things that I, you know, I just it's sad to me that we can't have a, a non-political discussion. You know, in corporate America, you wouldn't build a building without a fitness center. I mean, let's be honest, it just wouldn't happen. You know, uh, maybe a warehouse or something, or but I would bet, you know, um, everything's got a fitness center. I had a they took a they, I took a tour out on a farm. Um, Al Junkie, Representative Junkie, had when he was in here he had a tour where he'd take out a member from the metro that didn't know much about farming. So it was like I call it bring a dummy to the farm day. So I got invited, and uh, it was it was a blast. It was a dairy farm. So we went up in this building and, you know, they had the kind of command center with all the computers because these modern farms are amazing. But, you know, they had a, f in this farm, they had a treadmill and they had other, you know, they had workout stuff. So it's sad to us. It's sad to me um, that we're not, you know, if it's not for the members that we're not doing it for our employees. But uh, I, I think this is right for Minnesota, and I think our folks are going to have better access. I mean, think about the, just backing up for a second. I mean, there was no women's bathrooms. There was nothing in the Capitol. I mean, times are different. And uh, to serve the public, things have changed since uh, Cass Gilbert built the building, and uh, I'm, I hope we do it right. Thank you, Representative, Representative Louie. I have four more people on the list, and then I'm going to turn to Mr. McCormick. So he can talk us through, so we understand where we are in terms of a vote. All right. So well, I have five people on the list. All right. I have uh, Representative Dean Kelly, Albright, Sanders, and Doubt. All right, Representative Dean. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, uh, I think that um, well, just first of all, I, I just have a question for Mr. Wozlowski. Um Currently, we have uh, we have a, a plan designed for the Capitol. And, and really that's my emphasis has been the Capitol building itself um, and making sure that we restore that correctly and improve it for the people and uh, for the next hundred years. And I think we're on our way um, to doing that. Uh, Ten years ago it was a partisan issue uh, to restore that Capitol and uh, over the course of the time that I've been here it has become gone from being a partisan issue and a unpopular issue to a bipartisan issue and very uh, one that everybody can get around and I think that that process has been very good um, but when we look at the current plan we have Senate offices on the entirety of the third floor that are planned for the off the, the building uh, we have Senate offices uh, for the Senate majority leader in the suite above the governor's office, one on the first floor pairing the governor's office on the east, and two on level G. Uh, what's going to happen if all of the senators are going to move across the street? What's going to happen to all of that space on three uh, adjoining the Senate uh, chambers uh, and uh, in the Senate, the places that we currently have scheduled for Senate office? Mr. Madam Chair, Representative Dean, um, well, first of all, that would be a discussion, um, I think, first at the Preservation Commission level, but um, also with um, uh, the tenant groups themselves. Um, I can share some thoughts that I have is that building um, um, really is a place where the public can come, so you have any public facing. Uh, uh, organizations that, for example, you could have the Legislative Reference Library, you could have constitutional 
okay. uh, officers. Um, so you more the public facing elements of those Secretary of State, uh, for example. Understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rozlowski. So we don't have a current plan for how to repurpose the current plan that we have through design development for the entirety of the building. Mr. Rozlowski. Madam Chair, Representative Dean, that's correct. So this is obviously we first need to see if this proposal is moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Was Ms. Thank you, Mr. Wozlowski. Um, I think that's an important point. Also, uh, and very quickly, because I know we're uh, we're running short of time. Currently, we have $76.8 million in the revised plan for this building and parking area for the senator's staff and for 20 uh, handy, uh, disabled spots for people across the street, ADA spots. Is that $76.8 million, because we're putting more people in the building, I assume that this building is a little bigger than it was before. Is that correct, Mr. Wislowski? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Dean, it's about 11,000 gross square feet more than the, um, the previous uh, plan. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Wislowski. Um, in we've put some mechanical stuff on the roof. Um, we have uh, made the building a little bit bigger uh, to house these folks. Um, we've made it more expensive. Uh, would that be fair to say, Mr. Wislowski? Mr. Wislowski. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Dean, on, on the overall cost, the original numbers, you had about $63 million for the office uh, space and about, um, you know, there's 12 to $13 million for that associated with that parking. So you're, um, you certainly are, the increased space isn't for free, so you have to pay that increased cost on a, by adding more people in it, by, so you're increasing the use of the building. Um, you know, on a pot per occupant basis, um, um, you know, that cost would be roughly the same, but on an overall cost basis, yes, you've increased the size of the building, so that comes at an increased cost. Thank you, Mr. Wozlowski. And I, I think that's really, uh, that's really what we have here is, is the problem that we had a year ago. Um, we've got a building, the Capitol building restoration that we all agree on and we want to do and we've got Republicans and Democrats and I see Representative Drazkowski who's uh, about fell off my chair when he voted for the uh, bonding uh, for the project to restore the Capitol. He's not one fond of very, very many bonding projects but he's fond of this one. Um, that we've gotten bipartisan support around this but this building is wagging this, the tail is wagging the dog of the capital restoration. As we saw last year, this building design for the Senate dictated the restoration capital. And now here we see again, we don't, un we don't know how many of the Senate offices are going to remain. So there will have ceremonial or two offices for senators or what we're going to have with the balance between the two buildings moving forward. And what we've had is we've had a problem in the process and we've solved it by making this building bigger, more expensive, and uh, and available, and we've, we've cut off public parking. Uh, so I think this is a step backwards um, for the capital restoration project. And um, my, uh, my, my long-term uh, professional goal is to be a retired Minnesota Historical Society volunteer uh, who gives tours of the capital when I'm very old. Uh, and so that's actually my primary interest, all full disclosure here. So, um, uh, but um, uh, that, that's where I see the, the issue moving forward. And I think you have a lot of people who are very uh, talented people with the Department of Administration. The architects are fabulous. The contractors are second to none. Uh, but we've just put them in an untenable position by this process. And so when you hear, uh, when you hear the, um, the uh, the complaints from uh, the process. I don't think it's um, I don't think it's fair to just chalk it up as partisanship or um, uh, or just uh, uh, kind of uh, you know bumps in the road that are normal in building a public building because that's not what we've seen in this in this case. I do just want to um, remind members of the committee that uh, the plan that the Senate had um, sent us in the schematics. Uh, was uh, full with 44 offices for the senators, for the staff. Um, the, the space was um, utilized. And so 
when 67 offices are in that building that will displace some of the Senate staff that were likely going to be in that building. There will be hep there will be migration back to the Capitol. So it, I think um, the, the, the notion that there's going to be vacant space is a false notion. I think that uh, there isn't, uh, between uh, the current occupants in the Capitol and what we know here, um, that uh, both the Capitol and the State Office building are full. Um, between our staff and the members. Uh, and when I think about uh, my visits uh, to where the Senate minority space, now it's the Senate minority space, the Republicans, but when the Democrats were there, I spent some time in that part of the state office building. I was surprised to see where members were tucked into very, um, what I would not consider um, very functional using user space. And when I think about the public trying to find um, members of the Senate in this building, um, I was, I, frankly, I needed a map, and I'm pretty familiar with this building, to find some of the members of the Senate and where they were housed um, on the different levels uh, on the lower part of this building. Um, and that's true for the Capitol as well. I mean, it's not like we're, you know, hanging out with a lot of extra space. And as the, uh, the work was done to conceive another office building for the Senate, that space was also um, going to be full. So I, I, I don't think it is fair to say that there's going to be a lot of vacant space. I do think it is fair to say that we are coming up with an alternative that the tenants of the Capitol are going to have to make some decisions because now there are going to be 67 offices for the Senate. There are going to be 67 senators in that building. Um, that's a discussion for the tenants. Um, but I think there's going to be uh, there's you know, a not an abundance of space in this complex as it is. Um, we know that when we spend time over in the Capitol. And uh, I think the space will be well utilized. And then I know Representative Dean, you and I are going to disagree on this. Um, but the, the delay of the parking is not a loss of parking availability for the public because we are attaining, we're retaining the parking space at Sears. Um, and we're lucky for that. That means we can delay that and save $26 million. And the cost of the overall project because of that and the user fee for parking means the price of the project overall is coming down. Um, and I know we're going to disagree about that, but I think if we just do simple math, that part is clear. I have a few more people on the list. Representative Kelly, Representative Albright, Representative Sanders, Representative Doubt, and then I do want to get to Mr. McCormick. Oh, and Representative Zellers. Sorry, I thought I was on the Madam Chair. Uh, I didn't know the issue were, but, uh, but you're not. All right. Left off. Representative Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Lilly, I couldn't agree with you more, and Representative Hortman, you alluded to it. You know, this is not our building. This is not our offices. It's not our conference room. But there's one thing you left out. It's not our money either. So all these questions and all the the concerns that we have is about being fiscally responsible to our constituents, their money. So, um, uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate you walking us through the directive because I think it was cloudy as to how we got to this redesign, th this proposal in front of us. I'm just curious, and you also alluded to we all have our expertise. So we have the, the people with the expertise up there. As part of that directive, was it ever – just asked, you know, I, I know you're uh, cognizant of the cost, so was it ever asked where, from, a, from an architect standpoint, from a construction standpoint, this is just too much money. Where can we save? What could we build? Um, ha, did we ask that as a directive um, just to them? Uh, Representative Kelly and uh, members, I, I have certainly talked about cost with Mr. Woslowski. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Thank you. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I think Representative Kelly um, uh, speaks to that. You know, every one of us around the table comes from a, a, a background that, you know, I think asserts a certain um, degree of, of expertise, and, and, and I'm coming from it from a standpoint of um, a stewardship, uh, from uh, being called to uh, a higher expectation, and I, I, I want to address maybe a little bit of what uh, Representative Lilly said with regard to um, not to counter the issue of uh, a fitness center, but, you know, we are dealing not with a private uh, enterprise but with a public domain. We are called uh, to a much higher standard uh, because we are stewards. We, are, we have a fiduciary responsibility to look after um, 
that which has been entrusted to us, much like uh, Representative Carlson and I shared uh, a week or so ago. Um, you know, history is filled with the uh, uh, stories of, of uh, folks entrusting to others uh, their time, treasure, and talent. Um, and to that extent, we are, um, we have been entrusted with a, a great responsibility to look after that which um, will far and away uh, outlive uh, our days on this earth. And so it, it, it comes with no small bit of enormity to uh, the decision in, in front of us. Uh, and, and that gets to the point of, of I guess, for the remainder of this committee hearing and, and what I'm, I believe uh, Chair uh, Murphy uh, is, is going to lead us through is given the fact that I have been uh, a participant committee member on the uh, Capital Investment Committee, um, and it's been said before, but every time that the uh, state uh, purposes for the expenditure of state dollars, uh, that comes to us in, in a formal procedure and through a formal protocol. And to the extent that that has not been uh, exhibited here uh, with all of the various diagrams and paperwork that is laying before each one of us, um, I, I'm curious and I'm, I'm a bit troubled, <laughs> candidly, at what form, uh, what, what uh, 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 writ or, or uh, 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 vehicle uh, would be presented to us in order to, for us to constitutionally take a vote. Uh, and I'm sure that I'm uh, preceding some of the statements that will be said just uh, in a few minutes, but it, it is troublesome going back to the issue of being a steward and being a fiduciary in a trust capacity that we are looking upon this as a decision in a rules committee as opposed to taking it up before a capital investment committee, taking it up before a ways and means, uh, taking it up before the various um, arbiters of due diligence that any other piece of legislation would have to be conveyed through and, and, and be uh, vetted properly. And so I, I, I have great trepidation, great concern uh, that we are only fulfilling a modicum of our, our fiduciary responsibility here, and I look forward to understanding how the rest of that will be completed um, with the rest of this committee meeting. Thank you. Mr. Albright and Mr. McCormick will be able to talk a little bit about how we proceed, but the authority given to the Rules Committee to um, approve, uh, uh, to, to make this approval was in the bonding bill that Representative Ward carried and many of us voted for. Uh, next on the list is Mr. Sanders, Representative Sanders. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think my first couple questions are um, to the testifier um, from Mortensen. Um, when you went through this statement of project concept, I was looking through it. My eyes were kind of drawn to the asterisks and the, the fine print, if you will, um, that are on uh, the cost summary. Um, it says parking will be user finance resulting in 76 um, 0.794175 million total program cost for the Capitol building. My question is exactly what parking is included in user financed? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Sanders, uh, that is the lot B, uh, the, the parking, the 265 stalls that's included in this design. Um, we would do a cost breakout, and that cost breakout is currently estimated to be 12.8 million. Uh, of the cost of this project is associated with that parking. So that component would be user finance. So thank, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. And then Mr. Wozlowski, um, who then are the users? Who is paying that? Is that a similar scenario to what we have at the state office building parking with members and staff? How, how um, I, I guess I'll just reiterate that, who are the users that are financing this $13 million? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Sanders, it, the, the parking rates on for all the parkers on the Capitol campus would be how um, it would be paid back. So the parking rates uh, for the campus would be increased to cover the debt service uh, costs associated with it. And that's um, how other parking structures uh, have been funded as well. Madam Chair, then Mr. 
um, Moslowski, how many, how is that then the state office building parking ramp that we have now for <laughs> members and staff and then this lot B, what other ramps are included? And so my question is, is this members and staff or are members of the public, do we have other lots in here that are going to be contributing to this $13 million? Mr. Wislowski. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Sanders, it'd be all the parking facilities on the campus and it'd be our contract uh, parkers that uh, would cover that user financing. So in the, you know, for example, the, bill, the transportation ramp, uh, the building the ramp that's being built next to the transportation building that's financed the, the same way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Wazlowski, what's, what's kind of the estimated cost um, then for that, I mean, obviously you have the grand total, so you, you had to get to that point at somewhere. So, I mean, we're talking about well over 10% of this project being uh, financed through user fees. Um, what, ki what type of costs are we looking at? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Sanders, um, combining this with the parking that's being constructed on uh, next to the transportation building, we're estimating around a 40%, 40 to 45% increase of parking rates on the campus. Um, should be noted that the campus parking rates are uh, what many people would be considered below market rate uh, if you're comparing to parking rates in downtown St. Paul or downtown Minneapolis. And Madam Chair, Mr. Wazowski, how did we arrive at that, you know, relatively close to $13 million number? What, what was the genesis for saying we need $13 million of this $90 million project to be financed by user parking fees. Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Sanders, uh, we relied on the expertise of, of our partners in Martinson to, to do a cost <coughs> estimation of the overall uh, project. Obviously, there's, there's integrated pieces here. The uh, structural system that supports the offices is on the ground level, but they did a, a breakout of, of the cost uh, based on current design and estimates. And then, Madam Chair, my, my last question, following up kind of what Representative Kelly was asking on, I'm curious, did we ever, um, you know, did Mr. Wazowski or, or some of the other designers, was the question ever asked, you know, what if we had to cut $20 million from this project? What would that look like? Um, did you ever go through those sorts of questions and looking at, you know, if we wanted to significantly uh, look at, um, you know, what a significantly reduced price tag would be, what would this um, Senate office building look like? Mr. Wisloski. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Sanders, um, uh, yes, and uh, certainly the governor has made many public uh, comments, as has um, House members of uh, both um, uh, on a bipartisan basis, what can we do to bring down the cost? Uh, we looked at, first of all, what we did is benchmark our costs uh, with other projects, similar projects out in in uh, this market and across the country. And we, uh, Martinson uh, and BWBR was able to help us with gathering those costs. What's it, what's it, how does this project compare to on a square, per square foot basis with uh, other similar buildings? To say, are we within a reasonable industry standard range based on current market conditions for the cost of this building? Um, and that analysis came back that yes, uh, we were, and we also, by the way, um, benchmarked the Anderson and even buildings, we inflated that to current dollars and compared it. Now, this building has some unique characteristics uh, from other buildings. It, it obviously has the hearing rooms. Um, it has broadcast media that's part of it, so it, um, that comparison um, gets challenging if you're comparing just to office space, but um, we have done that analysis. Uh, we also, um, through this process, uh, went through and, and um, did value selection of uh, where where can we save money and, and part of that um, there was uh, uh, originally we made some changes around the mechanical systems we've made significant changes around the landscaping the previous you know original concepts around the landscaping had uh, uh, basically a lot of trees um, above that plaza area and putting trees above uh, a parking deck is an expensive thing so we've pulled back uh, those trees. We've, as they noted, we've simplified the exterior design. So we went through really system by system to say, you know, how can we uh, bring this within uh, uh, a reasonable comparison with other projects. The one thing I would note on cost, 
the cost to a hundred year we have to think in terms of hundred year building this isn't a spec office building this is a building that the state is going to own for a hundred years so uh, you cannot just look at first cost it's looking at the total cost of ownership what's it going to cost to own and operate the building so we you know, for example we had lots of conversations about well you can <coughs> go with a lesser standard for the roofing system or for the windows or for mechanical units but that's you're going to end up doing replacements in 15 years, and that's going to cost you more than if you um, spent a little bit more money up front. And so we uh, focused on not only the first cost, but also the total cost of ownership. Representative Dow. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. If, if I might, could I ask that you have, uh, and I don't know exactly what uh, format you're planning to take here, but maybe it would be appropriate to have uh, Mr. McCormick introduce exactly what it is that, that, that we're going to be considering. I, maybe we should have asked for that a while ago, but um, could he do that and then I could speak? Okay. Is that, if that's your plan, Madam Chair. Uh, that would be fine, uh, Representative Nout. And I, I did just um, get word that we have someone who uh, is here who would like to testify as well, so I want to make sure there's time for that. Mr. McCormick. Madam Chair, members, the House Rules Committee is here today pursuant to legislation passed at the end of last session in both the omnibus tax bill and the omnibus bonding bill. Under those pieces of legislation, the House and Senate Rules Committee, as uh, tenants and concerned parties, were given approval authority, specifically a requirement that the plans and specifications for the new legislative office building um, are subject to approval. As these provisions are read, it's clear that both the House and Senate have to approve the same plans and specifications, that they're not amendable by one of the two bodies without the other then having to ratify those changes. So in today's hearing, um, we would be ratifying the new and proposed um, elements and design for the legislative office building. That approval, if it's made by the members of the committee, would then have to go to the Senate for approval of the same elements and design. Subject to those approvals, then the building would go forward to be um, constructed and, and uh, financed. The um, uh, uh, last comment I would have is that in talking to Senate Council and referring to some of the attorneys upstairs, um, we think that the appropriate venue or method for the committee to go forward is a motion to be made. Uh, the motion could be to approve the plans and specifications as submitted by the Department of Administration or um, some variation thereof. Representative Dowd. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want to actually have somebody make that motion and then we can kind of speak to the motion? Thank you. So then uh, I will move that the House Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration approve the plans and specifications labeled Capital Office Building submitted by the Department of Administration to this committee on April 4th, 2014. Representative Dow. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question of clarification for you. Uh, in this plan, uh, David, dated April 4th, there are, it looks like two variations. Um, on the third floor uh, and on the second floor, there's a, there's a level two and a level two A. Um, does your motion specify which of those we'll be choosing, or will that be determined in the future? We are voting on 2A and 3A. Just for clarification, could you amend your motion to that effect? Mr. McCormick? Madam Chair, um, I think the motion then would be the plans and speci specifications, comma, including level 2A and level 3A, comma, of the document labeled capital office billing submitted by the Department of Administration on April 4th, 2014. Can you write that down? Madam Chair, and I will write that down for Thank everybody. Thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, if I could just, uh, as a, another question of clarification, um, does that then exclude uh, the, the pages that say level two and level three? We'll be voting on 2A and 3A. I guess my question, Madam Chair, was for Mr. McCormick. Mr. McCormick. Madam Chair, yes. 
Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Do you mind if I proceed? Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, members, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated uh, with this process, and, and I know that government isn't always easy, and the number of times that I've heard people say uh, making laws is, is like making sausage, and <laughs> um, neither one of which is, is pretty, I'm sure. Um, but this really, I have to tell you, is not uh, the way that I had hoped that this process would work. Um, I, I do believe that this language uh, belonged in a bonding bill that required a three-fifths majority vote, um, which it uh, did not. Um, we've heard testi testimony today from members of this committee that uh, there was no building in the uh, language that we passed last year, last year in the tax bill. Uh, you know, as I read this, uh, there is a building in that language. Um, in fact, you have to get to the second page of the language, almost to the bottom, before you get to the $3 million appropriation um, that, that allowed for the design. What we don't have or didn't have in, in the tax bill last year was the authorization or the, excuse me, we had the authorization. We didn't have the appropriation for this building, um, which I'm, I'm rather disappointed that we're proceeding uh, with no line, uh, with no money appropriated, uh, with no plan to pay for this building. Um, and, and frankly, this isn't the way we should have proceeded. Uh, the fact that this has moved completely on partisan lines, I think, uh, indicates uh, a, a deeper problem. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, obviously this is the first time in a generation where one party has controlled all of state government in St. Paul. Um, we've already seen out of the Democrat majority the largest spending increase in state history this biennium, uh, one of the largest tax increases in state history. We've seen Democrats uh, put themselves before the voters and the public in numerous ways, and this is just the latest. Uh, they've exempted themselves from the gift ban so that they can eat free meals. They've passed legislation to give the governor and, and, and uh, commissioners pay raises and a constitutional amendment that would give themselves a pay raise. Or, or a pay cut. And now, uh, you know, Democrats are, are moving forward today uh, building a, a, a $90 million palatial Senate office building um, that the governor himself called lavish and un-Minnesotan, not more than two or three weeks ago. And here we are uh, with a new proposal on the table that somehow is supposed to make us feel better. And what has happened through the process is now uh, Democrats are all of a sudden fiscally responsible. We've got a, a, a building that's only 77 million now. And the way that we got there was to increase the footprint of the building, not the footprint, the, the, the square footage of the building. And we trimmed the price by eliminating the public parking ramp from the project. Uh, this is the part that shocks me. And if that doesn't sound like self-service before public service, I think we all need to look at our priorities. This, it just astounds me at to what level the DFL is tone deaf on this issue. And, and listen very closely to my voice, members, because this is what the voice of reason sounds like. This is the last opportunity to take an exit ramp. <coughs> Vote against this proposal. Listen to your governor, who said that this is un-Minnesotan and lavish. Let's put the public before ourselves and vote no. Representative Sellers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, just uh, one quick question. So, in or excuse me, <laughs> didn't want to give you a demotion, Mr. McCormick. I almost called you a rep. Um, to Mr. McCormick's point, this does have to go back over and be ratified by the Senate. What happens if they don't do that? Representative Sellers, it is my understanding that if they don't do that, then uh, the building doesn't uh, proceed. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. One other question on that, uh, and this may be a, a bigger question for the CAP Board or uh, some of the restoration folks. What happens then to the restoration of our fine capital? Uh, Mr. Wislowski? Madam Chair, Representative Zellers, um, we would, uh, if the new building doesn't happen and there's not an alternative that's identified, we would be looking at redesigning capital restoration 
um, and you know, basically the Senate would retain control of the space they currently have. Um, you would have to look to add back in you know, three legislative hearing rooms into the Capitol. You'd look to add back in Senate media operations into the, the broadcast uh, component back into the Capitol. Um, so obviously you'd have a, a significant redesign effort related to capital restoration. And Mr. Wislowski, could you talk about the public space that um, we would lose in the Capitol? Please. Madam Chair, rep happy to. So the plan that we put forth on capital restoration, um, as you go through, you know, we've talked about uh, the additional dining capacity. We've talked about uh, for the public. We've talked about uh, classroom space for the public. Um, throughout the plan, there's where we've we're utilizing space um, that's been freed up through this process to improve the function of the building for the capital and. As part of a redesign process, you're certainly going to have to look at those spaces and, and say to get everything back in um, that you need to get back in, you're going to have to take away some of that functionality. And Mr. Wislowski, that would include losing that only women's, there is no women's bathroom on the first floor of the Capitol right now, and we would lose that as well, which would be a shame. I won't ask you to answer. Uh, Representative Pepin. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. Madam Yep, yeah, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Just, nope, I'd, I'd be very brief. and. Um, Madam Chair, and, and the, my point to be made on this is uh, that uh, it follows what Representative Dean is talking about is that uh, we all support on a bipartisan basis the restoration of the Capitol. I mean, we tried to pass a bill. Unfortunately, we didn't have the votes to do this a couple years ago. We thought we had the votes and we were all going to march forward and we were going to pass all of it in one big chunk so we could move forward and we probably would have been a long way down the road but there weren't enough of us and apparently not enough of you all to pass that. So the politics that enter into this, uh, and I don't, it's, for me it's not a, a partisan thing, it's the fact that our, our capital, I gave a tour to a bunch of nursing students yesterday that just happened to be walking around the capital and were poking their nose and I said, you want to come in and see what it's like on the floor? I am damn proud of our capital. It is one of the best and brightest things that you come and see and watching kids come down here in the spring and walk up those stairs and look at the horses that's what we should be fixing the reason that this thing is sideways in the ditch on fire upside down is because you're throwing this into it and no offense we're supposed to be a part-time legislator and I think that's why you see some of the objections to all the extra space all the extra stuff for the legislators who are supposed to be here part-time if you want to put more public space into the Capitol or over in here, I'm all for it. I don't know that we use the downstairs old cafeteria. We don't think that's been used for years. On the sixth floor, there's legislative library space we could use. I'm all for that. But the fact that if the Senate says no to this, and I don't know, maybe it's been pre-conferred and there's, you know, the grand deal is in and we're all going to just sit back and watch it unfold. But if not, if we now put the Capitol in jeopardy yet again, and your bathroom, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think that is the problem. That is the the overall frustration with this process is depending on the week, depending on the month, depending on the committee hearing, it is changing. And I am absolutely fearful, beyond fearful, that this is going to jeopardize rebuilding our beautiful capital, all for a legislative office building or a Senate office building or whatever you want to call it, uh, for the senators. And I don't care if it's for the senators. No offense to them, but, you know, it, this is going to put in jeopardy the building of our capital and the restoration of our capital because each and every time we come in here, we change the plans. And I, I'm not going to ask, and I, I do want to thank Mr. Wazlowski, Catherine, <laughs> and Mr. Huber. Thank you guys for coming in. You do fantastic work. Representative Dean has been nothing but great things to say about your work as you know, construction and as architects. Thank you for venturing into our political mess. We apologize for you all getting into it. But thank you for all that you do. None of this is at all any way directed at you. We know you will do very well by us if we ever do get to the point of rebuilding the Capitol. Uh, but thank you for coming down here. But that's where this is. That's where it comes from, Madam Chair, is that we're jeopardizing finishing the Capitol for an office building that is no offense, designated for the senators. And that is my biggest frustration. And uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if a roll call has been requested on your motion, but if not, I'd like to request one. Thank you, Representative Sellers. Um, Representative Sellers, if it would be okay, could I invite um, Ms. Wilshire up? She's waiting to testify. Um, and we'll have her come up. Uh, come up. Well, welcome to the committee. Thank you for coming back. I'm glad that you were here. Uh, and then we've just got a couple people left on the list.
Good afternoon. Please identify yourself. I had good morning on my notes, so I did change that. So we we all know it's good afternoon. <laughs> my name is Joan Walshire, um, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Council on Disability. And thanks so much for letting me speak here. Uh, MISGOD was created uh, 40 years ago as an advisory state agency to the governor, state legislature, state agencies, and the public regarding disability issues. I wanted to speak with you briefly here today regarding the proposals before you and a facet of these proposals that has often been overlooked during this process, and that is access. Access is critical to the disability and aging communities. Many features that were once thought of as utilized by only a small portion of the population are now in high demand by many users. In addition, both state building code and federal access guidelines require accessibility in a wide range of elements in new construction and remodeling projects. Things such as access to the path of travel or tunnel system, parking, individual offices, meeting rooms, hearing rooms, restrooms, food areas, and more, they must all be accessible. Ms. God wants to remind you to consider people with disabilities and ensure them opportunities to participate fully in their government as well as possible employment opportunities within the state. A capital complex that is fully accessible to Minnesotans with all disabilities must be created now. As over the next 30 years with the aging of baby boomers, um, our state will experience an older and increasingly disabled general population, workforce, and legislature. <coughs> with accessibility and cost effectiveness in the forefront here of our mind, we lean towards new construction and would advise creating a new legislative office building. Of the options that we have examined, no other proposal offers the amount of access and opportunity that this building does. One fact to be aware of is that building access into a newly constructed building where it is designed in from the beginning is much less expensive than trying to provide access in an existing building. According to the U.S. Access Board, an independent federal agency um, that's dedicated to improving access nationally they state that to provide access in a newly constructed building will cost less than one half of one percent of the construction costs. It is also important to note that several of the alternative facilities are of historic status. So that total cost of renovations, including accessibility upgrades, will be an expensive component compared to building a new building where accessibility is already planned into it. If an alternative proposal can provide the level of access that the legislative office building does, we would certainly support it. Our main concern is having legislative office space that limits citizens, advocates, staff, and legislators with disabilities from fully participating in government and employment opportunities. It's not just an inconvenience in many instances. It's actually sometimes an impossibility to access some of these um, locations that you are looking at. Um, which brings me to my final comment here. Uh, one of the other elements that needs to be recognized here by the legislature is if, when you're looking at your final decision, if it adversely impacts the disability community by preventing or limiting full participation in state government. This may open the state to external civil rights litigation. As you consider your options, um, please remember to um, question the level of access and its impact and cost in each proposal. Um, as was stated earlier, um, the building, you know, will serve um, the public and its needs. Um, and just an added note here, if the new Senate building is not built um, and we look at a redesign again here of the Capitol and its restoration process, we'll need to be involved again with the redesign and looking at some of the accessibility features that are currently missing and need to be put into the Capitol to bring it up to ADA compliance. So, um, I thank you for your time here, and we wanted just to keep you up to date on what the, the disability community is needing. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And is there anybody else here who w wishes to testify? I didn't have anybody let me know. All right. Well, thank you very much. I have a couple more people on the list. Representative Loon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just, you know, as we're getting close to voting here, I just need to be clear on what it is, the motion that's before the committee. Um, and, and perhaps it's more just having you clarify your intent with the motion. Um, I understand from the alternative drawings, and we've gone with 2, 2A and 3A, but is, that, is it your intent that there will be 67 permanent offices for the senators in this building, or is it your intent that 67 offices, but 
at some point the senators would have the option of choosing uh, between this building and the Capitol because I think that's an important distinction to be made so the committee's clear on what it's voting on. I understand we've had a lot of great discussion about process and obviously <coughs> we're one part of a, a two-body system here and the Senate will weigh in but I think we need to send a clear directive as to what uh, this committee's uh, Preferences and what what our decision is. So could you clarify that for the committee before we vote? Sure representative loon uh, and Representative or mr. McCormick has uh, <coughs> Clarified the motion which I can I will get back to but in terms of intent we are our, our responsibility is to approve a plan and We have altered the plan uh, Well, we actually asked the administration to deliver to us a different plan an alternative from what the Senate Senate has already proposed um, which has instead of 44 offices for the senators it has 67 offices for the senators and I think that sends a very clear message it is our intention um, my intention that the building be built with 67 offices and that is why we're approving the plan as designed 2a and 3a 67 offices for the Senate madam chair is that 67 permanent offices for the Senate uh, Representative Loon, uh, they're, they're, I, I, I don't, can you define for me permanent? Um, meaning each senator mean having. Never, they would never ever, you know, in a 50 years from now, they wouldn't ever change the construction of the building. I, you know, I can't predict 50 years from now. I hope I'm still alive 50 years from now. That would make me, you know, more than 100 years old, which would be super cool. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I can't predict what's going to happen in 50 years. But the offices as designed here are offices built they're not uh, temporary they're offices for 67 office for 67 senators all right madam chair let me try this from a slightly different angle is it your intent that each senator would have one office uh, I think we are approving a plan uh, with 67 offices for 67 senators in a Capitol office building that's what we're that's what we're approving today that's what's before us and, and so madam chair in your motion then there would still be the leeway for the possibility of a senator with an office in the state office building to also have an office in the Capitol is that correct uh, representative Loon, I think it is possible that Senator Bach or Senator Han in the current construction of the Senate could have an office in the Senate or in the Capitol once this is done um, but this the building uh, and the capital restoration won't be done until 2017, <laughs> right? So there will be uh, there will be iterations of members of the Senate moving into the building um, and moving out of the Capitol as the capital restoration is occurring. And uh, I think that uh, the plan that I've seen, and I know we've talked already about this, that the, the plan that they had come to us had 23 Senate offices in it because there were 44 offices in the new building as the Senate approved it we are approving a different plan with 67 offices in it the tenants are going to have to take up that conversation again uh, but I um, my intention is 67 offices in that new building for 67 senators and they're going to take their they're going to take their way they're going to get over there I know that they are but our authority today is to approve a plan with 67 offices um, not 44 as came to us but 67 from the House of Representatives back and that's what's before us today so madam chair so then with your intent of 67 Senate offices in the building mm -hmm. is it also your intent that there would not be 23 offices for senators in the Capitol uh, Rep uh, representative loon it would be um, my disappointment if there were 23 offices for the Senate in the Capitol once the new building is built but the question before us today is about this plan with 67 offices for the Senate. And that's what we're going to vote on today. And I hope you're going to join me. Well, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know of any other way to ask the question. I've asked if it's to be permanent. I'm, I'm trying to ascertain if we are allowing the possibility of one or two or more senators to have multiple offices I think that's a very important point for the committee to ponder I understand that the Senate will have an opportunity to weigh in and 
this will be the subject of some negotiations but it's important that this committee clarify its intent so I, I do think your, your motion needs to be a little clearer on that point representative doubt I think I might be able to f at least help us find the answer to this question um, I have the language from the tax bill last year I do not have the language from the bonding bill the capital uh, investment bill that had the language that required this House Rules Committee uh, to approve the, the construction of the building. The answer may lie in what that language says. If it says that we just need to approve the construction of the building, um, because the language uh, in the tax bill from last year, um, I guess what section, maybe doesn't matter, section 21, um, e, uh, the Commissioner of Administration uh, must not prepare final plans and specifications for any construction authorized under this section until the program plan and cost estimates for all elements necessary to complete the project have been approved by the Senate Committee on Rules and Administration. So this requires that the Senate Rules Committee will approve the final plans. Um, I don't know if staff has the language from the, uh, it may not matter at all what our you know the in intricacies of what our motion here is if we only have the ability to approve the building uh, this language in the tax bill last year gives the Senate the authorization to approve the final plans um, so uh, you know that that may be where we can find the answer Mr. Madam Chair the bonding language states the plans and specifications for a new legislative office building as provided in 2013 house file number 677 Article 12, Section 21, are subject to approval by the House Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration in addition to approval by the Senate Committee on Rules and Administration. Um, the attorneys in House Research, having reviewed the Senate and House language, believe that the operative term final in the Senate language applies also to the House Rules Committee, that both rules committees have final approval and this is also and it's a longer analysis layered into other provisions in the bill um, today what we are approving are the key elements of this building because the building is being built on a design build model arguably the final plans come with the key to the building because the design and the build go out in a concomitant nature Therefore, at a later date, it's probable that the House and Senate Rules Committee will have to approve the final plans as those are developed as the construction continues. And that could be some months down the line. Um, so what we have here is an approval of the building by the House Rules Committee with key elements as specified in the plan. If ratified by the Senate, those same elements will be approved by the Senate if those plans are then adopted and, and changed, the final plans will have to be approved by both the House and Senate Rules Committees um, pursuant to this language. Um, and Mr. Wozlowski maybe would like to weigh in on that. I can see he's going to jump forward. Mr. Wozlowski. Madam Chair, members, not that we don't enjoy coming to the House Rules and Senate Rules Committees, um, but here our understanding the basis for the approvals is um, under 16B-335, uh, three, three, the Commissioner of Administration, um, once we receive appropriations uh, for capital improvements, um, were to submit those plans uh, to the Ways and Means Chair, preliminary plans to the Ways and Means Chair, as well as to the Capital Investment Committee Chair, and the same to the Senate Finance Committee Chair. So that was the model that was used for um, coming to instead of going to the chairs it came to the the rules committee the issue with us um, and reason why it comes at preliminary design is you don't want us to design a project all the way to completion and then come back and have the the approving body say that this isn't the what we wanted or be correct so the structure that's in place and, and representative carlson can speak to this he signs these letters is that we we provide this that project concept um, as well as um, the cost so and the program information and that's what's submitted for approval under that statute we all, we come back if there's substantial changes to the program or to the cost now uh, we have to notify the, the committee chairs 
uh, of, of that change. So as, as we envisioned um, this, we did not anticipate that we'd be coming back. Assuming we're proceeding, proceeding with the uh, design that's approved, we would not be coming back to House uh, Rules Committee. Representative Blincheski. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to comment on something Representative Loon said, and um, I had the, again, I have my back to you, so I apologize. Um, I had the same question that you did um, about could there be multiple offices or whatever, and uh, and I learned in from Representative Mary Murphy, um, and this, it made sense to me then, because I was kind of wondering that too, is, is something I, you know, having never led a caucus, you know, I didn't know this, but so when, let's take, you know, Senator Pogamiller and Senator Sengem when they were doing the Senate, or Senator Bach and Senator Han, or right now, Representative Thiessen and Representative Doubt, when the caucuses negotiate space within a building, and we know how that happens when majorities change, it gets down to do this many people on floor three have to move there or whatever, that once a caucus gets a space, that the other three caucuses have no authority to tell them how to use it. So for example, Senator Bach can't tell Senator Han what to do with however many offices he gets and what space and whatever. And Representative Thiessen can't tell Representative Doubt where you know his staff should be or his media people or whatever. So that made a lot of sense to me then when I learned that understanding that the caucuses negotiate space and then each caucus has its own authority to place whomever wherever they want. Representative Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, it's been a really good dialogue for three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I mean that seriously. I don't, I don't mean that. I mean that seriously. It's been a good dialogue, and it is such a blessing to work together. You know, when we when we do a bill, when we do any bill or legislation, and the board lights up and it's all green, that really is to me really rewarding. It really is, and or all red. It's really rewarding. Um, <laughs> either way, you know. But I also respect. I don't know. I, we have 27 or 28 or 29 legislators here, um, Republicans and Democrats, and I, I, I also respect the difference of philosophical ideas, ideological ideas, uh, fiscal ideas, and I think we all do that. I hope we all do that. Um, I heard something about uh, stewardship, and I got to know the person that talked about stewardship today or uh, this year. And I really believe in sharing time, talent, and treasure as well. And every one of you and every one of my, our colleagues that aren't here do that and do that remarkably. Share that talent, time, and treasure. It's something I taught in my class when I was teaching my class. Um, and I, you know, we talked about part-time legislature. I think I think uh, Representative Zellers. Talk about a part-time list. I haven't found that piece yet, Representative Zellers, <laughs> that part-time piece. Um, I, you know, we are, uh, I, from greater Minnesota, are down here all the time, no matter if it's in, you know, in session. Of course, we're not here as much in the interim or whatever. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, I also heard something about self-serving versus being a public servant. And I'm, you know, and, and this, this legislation, this, this piece, to me, is about being a public servant. It's about the public. I have a state Republican senator who I really respect and really enjoy working with. Her office is in the basement by an alley that has continual garbage trucks going by and making noises. She can't have her constituents visit with her in that office. And she tells me about it all the time. And Senator Rood loves visiting with her with our constituents. She is a great public servant. And, 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 you know, I just think it's an appropriate time to look at uh, being fiscally wise, being futuristic, uh, having a plan that is a plan that serves our citizens of the state of Minnesota and that we are able to work with also. Um, I'm not here to self-serve myself. And I don't think any one of you, any one of you and any one of our colleagues are here to self-serve ourselves. We have a difference of opinion and, and ideology sometimes, but I don't know one legislator on the House side 
I won't speak for the Senate, Amen, but, but on the House side, that are self-serving. We are public servants, and I've seen that in all of us. And this is a building that is about, in my opinion, this is a building that is about that. And sure, it's going to be controversial, and there's going to be um, uh, difficulties with getting it done, uh, as we have witnessed as, as also. But you know what? It's been transparent. It's been, we talked about it. We spent three and a half hours now talking about it here. And prior, uh, the leadership has gone out and, you know, asked for alternative methods because in the last committee, we've, that has been raised by all of us, not just one of us. And uh, Representative Loon, I was there when Representative um, Lincheski, I almost forgot her last name. Don't ever do that for the tax chair, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, raise the question about your, your question about multiple offices. And so we all, we all share commonality uh, with concerns. But again, we've got to get to a final product. We've got to get to something that, you know, in the end, uh, it comes to finality, wherever, you know, whatever that is. And so I just want to make sure that the public that is hearing knows then none of this is about self-serving. None of it. It's about being a public servant. And, uh, and I think this, this project uh, does just that, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ford. I've got Representative Sarah Anderson and Representative Doubt on the list. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Anderson, S. Um, I just had a question uh, for Mr. Waslowski, if I could. What is the arrangement, and maybe this is not a, a question you can answer, but what is the arrangement then with the Sears for the parking lot? Uh, Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative, we have a, um, we're just wrapping up a, a two-year amendment, um, so I, and I believe it runs, um, I'd have to get that exact uh, timeline down, but it was a two-year extension. We also, in the previous version, we had a 90-day uh, termination provision on either side, and, and I believe we've extended that out to six months. But I can <coughs> send you those uh, specifics. Okay. They, they have. And Mr. Excuse me. Go Representative. Ahead. I would just say, yes. you know, they're still, um, I think, actively working on their redevelopment project. It's just probably not moving on the timeline that they originally hoped. And Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, Mr. Wazlowski, when you say the redevelopment, then is the plan then that down the road they will give their six-month notice and we will not have that space any longer. Mr. Westloss? Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, I mean, we, they've been through the, um, just the broader picture thing, um, Sears created a separate division within their company uh, about maximizing their real estate assets. Um, that, the St. Paul site was identified as one of their top eight sites for redevelopment. Um, so I, and then they went through the, both the cap board approval process and the city approval process. So I take them very serious that they're, you know, we have to plan that at some point in the future they're going to uh, uh, move forward with that redevelopment. So I, I would expect, not necessarily, I, I don't think they, you know, would give a two-year amendment if they didn't think we were going to have the spaces available for the two-year you know, time frame. Okay. And Madam Chair and Representative Anderson. Mr. Wazlowski, uh currently the House uh, Speaker has a small office just off of <coughs> 217. Um, and they're not really used except for, you know, minor uh, events. Is that going to still exist or is there going to be an expanded footprint for the House or how does that work within the Capitol? Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, the, the, there's both a, you know, a number of changes that are going on with, with the House space in the Capitol. Um, there would be some uh, dedicated uh, caucus rooms, um, but there's also, as far as the offices, um, and this is uh, both on the Senate and outside, the idea was to have uh, both the speaker and uh, uh, minority leader having offices in, in the Capitol, um, and as well as the majority leader uh, for the House, so that the, we would create um, leadership positions within the House where they'd have space to, to meet with constituents and members um, as uh, floor sessions are happening or hearings are happening over in the Capitol. And just for the record, that small office in behind 217 is used very frequently um, by the current speaker. And Madam Chair, Mr. Representative Wa Anderson. Wazlowski, 
So, um, okay, I'll I'll pass. Thank you, Representative Gout. Representative Gout. All right, Mr. McCormick. Madam Chair, sure members, the motion that I'm going to read to you incorporates some of the committee sense on floors 2A and 3A. It would be that Chair Murphy moves that the House Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration approve the plans and specifications labeled Capital Office Building, including the specific proposals for floors 2A and 3A, <coughs> and removing the specific proposals for floors 2 and 3, submitted by the Department of Administration on April 4, 2014. Is that clear? And I will move again <coughs> that the House Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration approve the plans and specifications labeled Capital Office Building, including the specific proposals for floors 2A and 3A, and removing the specific proposals floors 2 and 3, submitted by the Department of Administration on April 4, 2014. And there's a roll call requested. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Murphy. Aye. Representative Albright. No. Representative Anderson. No. Representative Benson. Aye. Representative Carlson. Aye. Representative Doubt. No. Representative Dean. Nope. Representative Earhart. No. Representative Hansen. Aye. Representative Hillstrom. Aye. Representative Hoppy. No. Representative Hortman. Aye. Representative Johnson? Aye. Representative Kelly? No. Representative Lincheski? Aye. Representative Lilly? Aye. Representative Loon? No. Representative Moline? Aye. Representative Norton? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Aye. Representative Pepin? Representative Purcell? Aye. Representative Sanders? No. Representative Torkelson? No. Representative Ward? Yes. Representative Woodard? No. And Representative Zellers? No. The vote being 14 to 13, the motion is approved. And I thank you, members. Seeing no business before this committee, uh, the most. Uh, the minutes, Madam Chair? We, we did. Oh. We did the minutes. We did the minutes, Representative Dallas. I'm sorry you missed that. I did it. I want to thank everybody who's been along here. And the meeting is adjourned. Okay.